Okay, Wang Kong, can you share the screen now? Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So shall we start or wait yes. for, for one more minute? No, no, we should just start in time. So our, this is session QG3, Param Preet Singh and myself are co-hosts. Our first speaker is Wen Kong Gan, who will speak about properties of the spherically symmetric polymer black holes. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the warm introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. My topic is on properties of the spherical symmetric plum, uh, polymer black holes. Uh, the topic is based on our paper written by me and Dr. Newton Santos and Dr. Shu Fuen and Dr. Andrew Wang. Okay, uh, the topic was divided into four parts. We, we will first introduce the effective geometry and the quantum gravity, and then introduce the uh, BM, BMM model, um, and then introduce the properties of the solution, and then we come, come to the conclusions. Okay, so. Um, we know for curved spherical space time, um, the most uh, familiar space time to us is the structural space time. We know the horizon is at r equals to gm and the singularity is at r equals zero. And this curved space time bends the light cone towards the singularity. And all things uh, happen in the black hole interior and the uh, space time break down at the singularity. So this can be uh, seen uh, more clearly if we turn to the Kruskal coordinates. Uh, in this coordinates, <coughs> um, the R equals to gem is not divergent anymore, and, but the uh, R equals zero still diverges. So we know the singularity is the true singularity, but the horizon is only coordinate singularity. Um, furthermore, if we, try to do the uh, conformal transformation, we can come to the Penrose conformal diagram. We can see it clearly, the space time is cut off at the singularity. And uh, most of the physical quantities uh, is divergent there. So in uh, quantum gravity, the most important thing is to solve the singularity. Um, okay. So when we use phase-based variable to describe the uh, gravity theory, we usually use the gravitational connection and the spatial charts in loop quantum gravity. They are based simple Poisson brackets and the uh, space variable of the, uh, a phase-based variable can, uh, uh, the metric can be written in terms of phase-based variables. Also the, classical Hamiltonian constraint can be written in terms of them, from which we can get the equation of motion and we get the classical solutions. If we uh, define um, time parameter tau in terms of m and uh, t, we can finally get to the, uh, get to the, sorry? Uh, okay, so we can finally get to the, uh, black hole interior metric. We can see it clearly the, the space time is divergent uh, at the uh, PC equals zero. That is the position of the singularity. So we try to solve this singularity in loop quantum gravity. Uh, the loop quantum gravity can, uh, can solve the uh, singularity problem by using the quantum Hamiltonian constraint uh, the quantum const Hamiltonian constraint can be obtained by replacing the curvature by the holonomies and then quantize it. Uh, also, uh, physical quantities can be get by uh, some effective solutions. This procedure can be um, written in terms of the so-called polymerization of the effective canonical variables, which we just uh, simply replace the phase space where I'll be in terms of uh, sign functions. The classical limit can be obtained when we push the, um, 
quantum parameters delta B and delta C equals zero. So these two uh, parameters are very important in this polymerization procedure. And um, many different polymerization use different quantum parameters. Uh, here, I, I just show the uh, model proposed by Ashtaka and his co-authors in the, in the paper in 2018. Uh, the effective Hamiltonian can be obtained by replacing the uh, phase space variables and uh, uh, effective, uh, effective uh, equation of motion can be obtained from it. Also, we can get a solution. Now we can see it very clearly, the function of PC of T will not be zero anymore. So uh, in this case, the singularity is just to be resolved and the singularity is replaced by the so-called transition surface. We can see it more clearly uh, in next slides. Um, when we try to understand it, we need to use the energy condition. The energy conditions can be formulated in terms of the eigenvalues of the energy momentum tensor. Uh, the matter which satisfies the energy condition will produce gravitational force. And finally, in the chapter surface, we will um, finally encounter the singularities. But if the matter does not satisfy the energy condition, it will produce a Prussian force. And finally, we can uh, resolve the singularities. Okay, this is the panel stand. Uh, Ashtaka's model. We can see it clearly. The B region is just a black hole interior. And the singularity is replaced by some transition surface. After the transition surface, there is a white hole interior, which is um, make up of uh, anti trapped surface. So this is the uh, Paris diagram of the model. We can see it clearly. The Singularity is replaced by the transition surface, which connects the black hole interior and the white hole interior. This is the most important features of the model. <clears throat> okay, uh, but the model of Ashtaka uh, has some problems, such like the asymptotic fatness problem. So BM, BMM proposed another model by canonical transformation of the canonical variables. We can see they just define their canonical variables in terms of PC and PB. And um, <clears throat> they'll, uh, he, they do the polymerization just uh, by replacing the canonical momentum in terms of sine functions and they introduce two more constant parameters. A con uh, constant quantum parameters. Okay, uh, we can see the uh, variables just the following a simple Poisson brackets. And then the BMA effective Hamiltonian can be written in terms of them. Also, we can uh, get the effective equation of motion from this effective Hamiltonian constraint and also the solutions. Okay. When we plug this solution back into the um, metric, we can get the effective metric, which describes the effective black hole interior. Um, in our paper, we want to um, study the properties of this model. To simplify it, we first introduce three quantities, three parameters uh, here, the curly D, curly C, and X naught. So we can see after introducing these quantities, the metric is replaced by a more simple form, uh, 2.7. And we just uh, need to study the metric in terms of, uh, in, in the present, presence. Okay, so, um, so next, uh, to study the, this model, we, first we want to, try to pay attention to the location of the throat and the horizon and the asymptotic behaviors of the space-time. To do this, we need to study the, uh, the uh, energy conditions. 
uh, in terms of the energy momentum tensor defined in terms of the uh, Einstein tensor. We can calculate the uh, Einstein tensor of the effective metric and then define this energy momentum tensor in terms of it. This is the definition. Okay, we can get the um, energy density and the momentum density in terms of it. So this is the key quantities we want to use. Um, next, uh, I just show uh, some main properties of these solutions. Here we can see we plot figures in terms of physical quantities, so like rho and the rho plus PR and, and um, so on. <clears throat> we can see uh, this is the case with delta than zero and the credit than zero. In this case, the addition of the throat, uh, the throat means the transition surface, the transition surface um, inside the black hole. Uh, here, the X of H is the position of the horizon. This is the definition of the, um, the Sort in terms of the parameters. And this is definition of the horizon in terms of the parameters we introduced uh, earlier. So uh, next, we, we just uh, plot these um, parameters. Uh, sorry, we just plot these physical quantities of the uh, energy momentum tensor um, in, in this case, in this case. So we can see from the uh, first panel, this, this is the uh, interior of the black hole. This is the position. This is the position of the uh, black hole horizon. And this is the position of the white hole horizon. So this is just the interior of it. We can see it clear. Uh, the P plus, uh, rho plus PR is less than zero, is less than zero. So yeah, in the vicinity, oh, sorry, any question? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so we can see clearly the uh, energy condition is violated uh, in the vicinity of the of, of the throat. So uh, in this case, we say the uh, singularity is uh, is resolved. Okay, next uh, we, uh, we 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 talked. Uh, most of the parameters, uh, we just explore the uh, whole parameter space to study this uh, model. Okay, we, we can see this is a table for the case of delta greater than zero and for the subcase, case D greater than zero or the D less than zero. This is the most interesting case. We can see it here. <clears throat> uh, in this case, the black horizon exists and also white hole horizon exists. Also, so the energy condition is always satisfied at the black hole and the white hole horizon. Uh, also the throat, the transition surface exists. Uh, in this case, the energy condition satisfied if this condition is satisfied at, at the throat. So but we can- Four, four minutes we, including but questions. The, as, Four minutes, including questions. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay, okay, I, I will finish it. Okay, this this is just the uh, properties. So we can see the clear here in the delta equals zero, the black hole, white hole horizon coincide. This is less interesting. And the next, uh, the black hole horizon, white hole horizon doesn't exist. And finally, we come to the conclusion, the black hole singularity is naturally resolved in, in this model by quantum gravity effects and the singularity is replaced by the transition surface. And, uh, but we want to emphasize that this BM model is based on polymerization with a set of new cano canonical variables after canonical transformation. We do not know such canonical transformation can be carried out in Hercule or not. Okay, uh, that's all, thank you very much. Any questions? Hey, can I ask a question, Jorge? Go ahead. Okay. 
So I would just like to comment that I think it will be a good idea if you test whether in this BMM model the curvature invariants really have a really have a universal bound. Like you motivated this this model by saying that the AOS model has some issues and therefore those issues can be uh, like fine tuned in the BMM model. But the BMM model itself has various issues. They constructed this model just to uh, have a scenario where the Crashman scalar is universally bounded. But if you go to higher order curvature invariants, then the same model has lots of issues. It, it gets into various problems. So I think it will be a good idea if you check that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, we checked the Crashman scalar um, in our paper. I forgot to present it here. Uh, the Crashman the scalar in BM model actually have a upper bounds. So Actually, yeah. there is nothing divergent. That is true. Yeah, the model is constructed okay. to do that, but you yeah. don't have to worry about other curvature invariants. And the model is not; the model is uh, has limitations. If you will check that. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. It's time for one more quick question. Okay, if not, thanks, Wen Kong. Uh, could you please stop sharing your screen? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Harikat Singh Sahota. Could you uh, go ahead and share your screen? Oh, you can come in a little bit. Hello? So can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, should I start? So our next speaker is Rikat Singh Chahota and he's going to come in for that. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. The title of my talk is Infrared Signature of Quantum Bows in Collapsing Geometry. It is based on the work I have done with my supervisor, Dr. Kanjar Prochan, and it will appear on archive in, in a week or so. So here I will discuss more decomposition of wave packet constructed for dust shell collapse in quantum LTV model. I will start with classical description of LTV model and its midi superspace construction. After that, I will introduce its mini, mini superspace construction for this model. And, and describe singularity avoidance and bounds in the quantum model. After that, I will discuss the more decomposition of the wave packet constructed for the quantum model. Now, now the LTV model is an inhomogeneous extension of FRW model given by the line element in equation number one. Here, the object of interest is, is the function capital R, which is called aerial radius. The Einstein's equation when source is inhomogeneous dust is given in equation number two. Here, prime is derivative with respect to shell index rho and dot is derivative with respect to dust property in tau. And epsilon is the energy density for the dust. Here, capital F is first integral of Einstein's equation, which is interpreted as Meissner sharp mass. When we take initial condition that at tau is equal to zero, R of rho is equal to rho, we can write capital F and small f in terms of, in, in terms of energy density of dust at tau is equal to zero. Here, small f is an arbitrary function which gives the, which gives the energy of the dust shell at, at shell index rho. For marginally bound model, we can solve the Einstein's equation and its solution is given in equation number three. This solution represents a singularity r is equal to zero for this singularity curve. Therefore, classically, this model describes a dust cloud collapse to black hole singularity or dust cloud expanding from a white hole singularity. Now, the canonical analysis for this model was done by the group of Sinalovas, where, where they use the brown kukash description as model for dust, and the Hamiltonian constraint and momentum constraint for this model were derived, which is given in equation number four and five. Here, capital P tau is momentum conjugate to dust proper time, capital PR is momentum conjugate to aerial radius, script F, and capital sigma functions are given in equation number four. 
since in the hamiltonian constraint there is term script f pr square which is product of abl radius and momentum conjugate to area radius therefore this hamiltonian constraint exhibits operator ordering ambiguity which means that this classical hamiltonian constraint doesn't have a unique quantum counterpart therefore on quantization the miller duet equation is written in equation number 6 Where the function capital A and capital B describe the operator ordering ambiguity. The Hilbert space is chosen with major mu such that the Hamiltonian constraint is Hermitian. The incoming and outgoing modes in this in this model were associated with the solution of Wilder-Duet equation after making a transformation from co-moving time to killing time, capital T. to compute the hawking radiation for this model the bogolyov coefficients were identified with the projection of in outgoing modes with incoming modes and the and the thermal spectrum was recovered in this model now a mini super space construction so before going to that let me explain what mini super space and mini super space mean the mini super space means that the infinite dimensional degrees of freedom are reduced by using symmetric principle to 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 in to infinity fold degrees of freedom and in mini super space case the uh, the uh, the 10 fold infinity degrees of freedom are reduced to finite number of degrees of freedom so mini super space construction for this model was proposed by kefer using the fact that for marginally bound model different dust shell does not dynamically influence each other which implies they are decoupled and we can consider their dynamics separately therefore we are interested in writing on shell action for this model which dictates the dynamics of boundary that is outermost dust shell they started with einstein hilbert action with gibbs hawking yog term here capital k not is extrinsic curvature of hypersurface when it is embedded in flat space time this term is added to regularize the action now taking the trace of einstein's equation the on shell form of ricci scalar was obtained and the bulk contribution to the to the einstein hilbert ex, uh, action was obtained here capital r not is aerial radius of the outermost dust shell the boundary for boundary comprising of two space like hypersurfaces at tau1 and tau2 and a time like hypersurface coinciding with the outermost shell at rho not the boundary contribution was computed which is given in equation number 11 and full action for this model which dictates the dynamics of the outermost dust shell is given in equation number 12 the hamiltonian for this model is negative of adm energy and this system has classical solution given here which also describe a dust shell collapse to singularity again using brown kokosh dust as prescription for uh, uh, so, sorry uh, with use, uh, using brown kokosh dust the hamiltonian takes this linearized form again this hamiltonian also is product of aerial radius and its conjugate momentum therefore exhibiting operator ordering ambiguity the wilder duet equation for this model is written in equation number 13 and a, a general general factor ordering is chosen with parameter a and b specifying operator ordering ambiguity the hamiltonian is hermitian on the hilbert space with major r to the power 1 minus a minus 2b and the wilder duet equation is solved by separation and sorts and a wave packet is constructed using positive energy modes using a poisson like distribution this wave packet is sharply picked on the classical trajectory and to simplify the form of the wave packet the parameter of the distribution made a function of operator ordering parameter so in further analysis if we if we find the, the observables to be a function of operator ordering parameter small a we cannot distinguish whether it is a genuine artifact of operator ordering ambiguity or whether it is a dependence on the shape of distribution with this particular choice the simplified wave packet take form given in equation number 15 with this particular wave packet the expectation value of energy comes out to be inversely proportional to parameter lambda now the probability amplitude associated with this probability uh, with this positive energy modes vanishes at classical singularity thus avoiding singularity following dvx criteria and therefore all the wave packets constructed from this positive uh, positive stationary state uh, positive energy stationary states also avoid singularity here we have contour plot of probability amplitude of the wave packet for parameters small a is equal to 0 b is equal to 0 and lambda is equal to 1 
on x axis we have aerial radius and on y axis we have dust proper time this black black curve is the expectation value of aerial radius with the wave packet this red curve is the classical collapsing trajectory and this green curve is classical classically expanding trajectory and here we see that very early in the collapse the the quantum expectation value follows the classical expression at, and it differs at at the classical singularity takes a takes a globally minimum value and then it starts increasing therefore the dust shell collapse to singularity is replaced by a bounce a bounce from class, uh, collapsing phase to an expand to the expanding phase now there were some issues with the midi super space that i have described earlier the incoming outgoing modes that they they that that they have written are not orthogonal while the bogolyova formalism require orthonormal modes therefore the, the incoming and outgoing prescription is not well defined we need to identify an uh, identify an observable that depicts mode decomposition and momentum is a good choice for that case classically momentum is given by this expression and we can associate positive momentum value with with the collapsing phase and negative momentum value with expanding phase in the midi super space construction the momentum cannot be made hermitian while momentum can be made hermitian for the midi super space construction thus leading to orthonormal incoming outgoing modes now the measure that makes hamiltonian hermitian can also accommodate hermitian momentum with this representation for momentum operator as a special case we will work with measure r square which puts this constraint a plus 2 plus uh, a plus 2 b plus 1 on operator ordering parameters with this representation of momentum operator the eigen functions of the momentum operator are given in equation number 17 which are orthonormal and any wave packet can be decomposed in a fashion given in equation number 18 the incoming modes are then associated with the eigen functions with positive eigen value and outgoing modes are associated with eigen functions with negative eigen value ah. the in, uh, sorry yes hello okay okay the incoming and outgoing part of the wave packet are projection of the wave packet along the eigen states of momentum operator and since this function psi in k space is normalized we can associate psi k mode square with fraction of modes with wave number k now for the given wave packet the function psi k is of this form and we are interested in its behavior in various regimes at classical singularity tau is equal to 0 we can write psi k psi k 0 in this form which implies that psi k mod square is equal to psi k minus uh, psi minus k mod square which implies that the number of incoming modes is equal to number of outgoing modes at classical singularity for all wave number k also we can write psi k mod square which is given by this equation by looking at the integrand we can see that changing the sign of tau is equivalent to changing the sign of k therefore the incoming outgoing character flips at bounds for all all wave number of values we have we have found for small k and small tau psi k mod square comes out to be proportional to lambda to the power 1 by 3 thus the number of incoming outgoing modes of small wave number is sensitive to sensitive to the size of dust shell at bounds point since r r bar 0 also comes out to be proportional to lambda to the power 1 by 3 we define the difference between fraction of incoming modes and outgoing modes by function delta k tau which in the limit k going to 0 can be written in this form which on further simplification takes the form given in equation number 19 we can see when tau is less than 0 this function delta k is greater than 0 and when tau is greater than 0 this function delta k is less than 0 therefore in the collapsing regime the incoming modes dominate while in the expand in the expand expanding phase the outgoing modes dominate now here are some numerical results we have plotted along x axis we have wave number k 
and along y axis we in the first row we have psyche mode square and in second row we have ratio of incoming modes to outgoing modes and we have plotted them for different times this blue curve is for collapsing collapsing phase and and orange curve is for expanding phase the shaded blue region gives us the contribution of outgoing modes in the collapsing phase and the shaded orange region gives us the contribution of incoming modes in the expanding phase we see early in the collapse there is very small contribution of the outgoing outgoing uh, outgoing modes and the the major contribution is coming from the incoming radiation so four as minutes, we oh, okay okay as we move move toward the classical singularity we see that the contribution of outgoing modes keep starts starts to increase and it's become comparable to the contribution of in contribution of incoming modes near the boss point tau is equal to 0 after the bounce the similar behavior is observed in the expanding branch as well we see that the near infrared modes are most sensitive to the dynamics of the dust shell if one focuses on the infrared sector the information of bounce is carried over to the infrared modes much before the information of bounce arrives to any observer the infrared sector quickly adopts the characteristics of the dynamics and if we so the plots of ratio of incoming modes to outgoing modes are mirror symmetric there which implies that when we go from collapsing phase to expanding phase there is flip in the in the ratio of incoming modes to outgoing modes <coughs> Therefore, to see if the bounce has happened, the observer should look at the infrared branch of radiation instead of waiting for maximum of the distribution to arrive. These are some plots for the parameters which specify narrow wave packet, which represents high energy dust shell. Here we see that even near the near the bounce point, the contribution of the outgoing modes in in the collapsing phase is very small comparatively. Okay, summarizing, <clears throat> the infrared regime is sensitive to the dynamics of the dust shell. In collapsing branch, the outgoing modes contributes only in the infrared regime and vice versa. In the infrared regime, there will be a flip in the ratio of in the number of incoming modes to outgoing modes as dust shell crosses classical singularity. A co-moving observer looking at the collapse of dust shell should look at infrared regime for signature of bounce. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Corey, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. So, in your numerical simulations, uh, what was the kind of radius of the of the shell you started with, and what kind of mass dynamics were you using? Uh, yes, so so the parameters we have chosen is, for example, b is equal to zero and lambda is equal to one. We can, from this expression from energy, we can estimate the energy of the dust shell by putting. So since we have we have this constraint on the operator loading parameter, so for b is equal to zero and lambda is equal to one, we can estimate the energy of dust shell. And similarly, we can put these parameters in this expression to see the see the behavior of radius uh, aerial radius at different tau values. So my question is like, what was the maximum aerial radius in our simulation? Or, or maybe we don't know maybe that directly. So the max, maximum aerial radius can be anything since since this R of tau is proportional to tau to the power of 2 by 3 in the large tau regime. So it will... The reason yes. I'm asking is that the, if you will start from very large radius, you also have to control the dispersion in your wave packet. So I was just interested in asking, are you looking at a small batch of the simulations or are your simulations uh, uh, very good that they can, that your wave packet can be, uh, has a nice shape throughout the bounce? Okay, okay. Okay, we have, we have not looked at, looked at that. You need to move on, please, and share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you.
So our next speaker is Aurélien Barreau. Let's speak about a closer look at why whole remnants. Aurélien, can you share your screen? Yes, uh, let me try. Okay, is it working? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm just going to give a kind of overview of the situation of the phenomenology of bouncing black to white holes because quite a lot have been done. And as the models were being refined, the results were changing and I think the situation might not be very clear for everyone. I also apologize for having quite a lot of uh, written things on my uh, slide. It's quite ugly, but I like this because I think it makes the material rather uh, self-contained. Okay, so, um, okay. so uh, the, the basic uh, idea is, um, was uh, proposed by Ravelli, Vidotto, and a few others a few, a few years back. This is what I call prehistory. The argument was basically to try to understand in the black hole sectors the lessons from what we have uh, understood in cosmology. As we all know, the basic uh, modified Freeman equations uh, takes this, uh, this uh, form in blue quantum cosmology with this uh, corrective term, which happens to be actually dominant around the bounds when the density becomes Planckian. So the point here uh, is, of course, to um, deeply understand that quantum gravity effects can uh, take place, even though all the lenses in the, in the problem are much, much bigger than the Planck lens. Because, of course, everything here at the level of the background, this is not true for the spectra, of course, but at the level of the background, everything is driven by the density. So if we naively import those ideas in the black hole sector, as, um, as, as done by Vidotto and Rovelli in the first paper, you could expect a kind of Planck star core with a size given by this uh, trivial expression, if n equal one third. So the standard or, uh, event horizon would be replaced by an apparent horizon, which is locally equivalent to a usual horizon, but from which matter can eventually bounce out. So we went through the uh, phenomenology of uh, this uh, idea, and we uh, end up with a result that we could possibly investigate the, um, the, the events associated with such bounces if they are locally um, happening around us. So the maximum distance at which we could see a single event is of, is of the order of 200 light years, which is very small. And it means that our uh, visibility horizon is also really uh, around the, the solar system. Um, the, the, the number of events that we should expect cannot be calculated because, of course, we don't know the shape of the initial mass spectrum, and therefore, basically, anything can be expected. But what we can do, of course, is to compute the shape of the expected signal, which I show here on the left, and even possibly also the integrated uh, signal, because one might not only consider single event detection, but also the uh, space average signal coming from a distribution of events. And the funny point is that it might be compatible with some very uh, short gamma ray burst. However, I don't want to spend more time on this because this was prehistory and the model has been refined, uh, especially by uh, Rovelli and uh, Hagar, where um, those gentlemen discovered a metric which satisfies the Einstein's equation everywhere outside a small quantum region. So basically, the model describes a, a kind of uh, tunneling from a classical black hole to a classical white hole. And everything is seen in kind of slow motion from the outside just because of a huge time dilatation induced by the gravitational potential. Uh, I would like to mention that the model at the theoretical level has also been supported by quite recent works from uh, Wilson Ewing and his uh, colleagues. So I would not bet my life on it clearly, but still it has received some support. So the, the key point is that outside the horizon, the quantum effects are small at any time, but the, 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 the really important idea is that the time integration can lead to important cumulative effects, leading to a dramatic revision of the, um, of the usual scenario. 
So after a sufficiently long time, the black hole can tunnel into the white hole. Uh, so on, on the diagram, one is um, Minkowski, two is Schwarzschild, and three is basically the quantum gravitational region. So seen from the outside, the bouncing time is proportional to m squared in this model. I will come back later to alternative views, of course. And this k parameter here simply has to be greater than 0.05. So uh, initially, we, we thought that it might be related with some fast radio burst. I let you know from now on that I don't believe anymore in this model for different reasons, but one of the the most important reason is that we have seen some repeaters in fast radio bursts, and this is really something that you cannot do with, um, with such um, a, a scenario. Still, it is interesting at the astrophysical level to try to understand how it is connected with experience. And the first question we have to face is to understand the typical energy of the signal that would be emitted by such a bouncing black hole. So if you want the bouncing time to be the Hubble time, this fixes the mass and this also fixes the radius of the hole. So the first guess, which is quite reasonable, of course, is to say that the only length scale of the problem is the size of the black hole, and this is therefore the expected wavelength of the emitted signal. This is what we call the low energy signal. The other possibility is to take into account the, the time structure of the event, and I will come back to that later. So actually, point 0.02 centimeter leads to the infrared band. And one might wonder, could we experimentally detect such an event if it were to take place? And the answer is that it's not obvious. It's not obvious because when you really try to take into account the instruments that are operating at such wavelength, uh, probably uh, a, a signal from this origin would be identified as noise, mimicking, mimicking a kind of cosmic ray going through the detector. So it's not clear that even at the experimental level, it could be observed. Anyway, as you can notice, there are two orders of uh, magnitude or three orders of magnitude uh, of discrepancy between what is uh, actually measured for fast radio bursts and what is predicted by this model. The interesting point that I won't describe again because it is well known is that the redshift dependence is very weak and the reason for that is trivial. It's just because when you look far away, it means that the black hole bounced in the past and therefore its lifetime was smaller and therefore it was smaller and therefore the energy emitted is higher and this partially compensates for the redshift. Then we have this other component that I believe to be more, more interesting maybe, which is a so-called high energy signal, because this is not something you, you um, assume for ad hoc reasons. This is really what happens if you try to take into account the time reversal of the phenomenon that forms a black hole, because a black hole is interesting, of course, if it is a primordial black hole, otherwise uh, the, the scenario might be true, but you will never see anything because the lifetime will be much smaller than the age of the universe. And if this primordial black hole is due to fluctuations in the primordial universe, therefore, you know, depending on its size at which time it was formed, and therefore, you know the temperature of the universe, and therefore, you know the energy of the quanta that are expected to be emitted. So if you do the math, you end up with the uh, results that for k equal 0.05, the energy should be of the order of a TV. And basically, the, the, the black to white hole acts as a kind of redshift freezing machine. Okay, It takes a, a, a tiny amount of time for the fields that, are go, that go inside and then outside, but it takes 10, million, 10 billion years seen from the outside. And the funny point is that even in this case, you have this redshift compensation effect. The reason is slightly more subtle, because this time, when you look far away, you also have to consider a black hole with a smaller lifetime, and therefore they are lighter. They were formed earlier in the universe. The universe was hotter, so the compensation is not exactly the same, but it still works. Now you might wonder the number of expected events. And once again, it is impossible to answer because it fully depends on the mass spectrum of the, um, of the considered objects. I can only say that there could be as much as 10 to the 19 objects of this type in the galaxy, just taking into account a dark matter bound, but the number of expected events per unit of time is just not calculable with what we have. 
Okay, now let's uh, let's uh, look a bit uh, deeper and let's allow this k parameter which enters the model and which fix the lifetime to vary. The first question to address is the maximal distance at which one should be able to observe a single bouncing black hole. So I decided to focus only on emitted photons. You know, photons are a teeny percentage of the emitted energy, but they travel in a straight lines. They are not significantly absorbed. They are easy to detect. So even though we lose something like 98% of the signal, I prefer to focus only on gamma rays. The result, of course, depends on the size and efficiency of the detector, on the absorption process of our cosmological distances, and the number of measured photons required for the signal to be significantly above the background. So, of course, I skip the calculation, but at the end of the day, we end up with something like that, which shows the maximum distance at which an event can be measured as a function of this k parameter, which is unknown and just bounded from below. And this is the Hubble radius, this is a galactic scale. So basically what you see is that there are some funny structures. The, the global trend, of course, is a decrease, which is quite obvious. But those structures here are associated, for example, in this case, with the fact that you enter the visible band, and therefore you have larger detectors. So this is only due to our detection capability. This huge step here is also due to our detection capability because we, uh, we are above the threshold for chunk of detectors. But there are some interesting, very small structures. For example, here you, you, you begin to emit new particles that borrow some energy and do not decay into photons. Here you emit new particles that do decay into photons. And therefore, here you increase the sensibility and here you decrease the sensibility. It's not an important effect, but it's quite funny to, to investigate. And we went through a full Monte Carlo uh, simulation of the, um, of the spectrum of resulting gamma rays, taking into account both the direct and indirect emission. And basically, you expect something uh, peaked around 100 MeV. And this doesn't come as a surprise, because this is the rest mass of the neutral pion. And this is always what dominates uh, hadronic processes. You can play the same game for the other component. This is the same trend, but of course, the numerical values are quite different. So to summarize, the low energy channel leads to a better single, single event detection than the high energy one. Um, the difference of maximal distances decreases for high value of k. In the low energy channel, for the smaller values of k, a single bounce can be detected anywhere in the observable universe. And in all cases, the distances are quite large, and we are not confined to a very local um, detection in this case. Good. Uh, we can also consider the integrated emission, uh, and not only the single event uh, detection. So in this case, you, of course, have to, uh, to sum over cosmological distances and take into account all the absorption, redshift, and so on and so forth effects. And at the end of the day, the spectra obtained, of course, there are different curves because we don't exactly know the shape of the single even spectrum. So we are summing up signals that are not <coughs> perfectly determined at the individual level. But what is interesting is that we still keep a memory of the initial spectrum, which was, at least to me, not completely uh, obvious a priori. And this is, once again, due to this distance redshift compensation effect. And an interesting point is that we are very, very um, slightly dependent to the initial mass spectrum in this case. So in this case, it's a good news. Basically, whatever the reasonable uh, wide mass spectrum for the distribution of black holes, you end up with a very same uh, integrated spectrum. OK. Now we wondered if it could be possible also to address with such uh, events the so-called Fermi gamma ray excess. Uh, you know, um, it's uh, controversial and it's debated, and I don't have time to go into the details, but there are basically too many GeV photons coming from the galactic center. Of course, there are. Uh, explanations uh, that are less exotic than bouncing black holes. So I would not bet my life once again on bouncing black holes. But it's, it's an interesting, I think it's a stimulating intellectual um, exercise to try to understand if we can explain this signal, which is still quite mysterious. And uh, don't believe that it is uh, easy 
to play with the parameter and to explain anything. This is not the case. I will, uh, I will explain you why. So we focus on the low energy component. So we performed a full, once again, Monte Carlo simulation, taking into account the loon, the model implemented in PTIA to um, determine the kind of shape of the gamma ray spectra. We performed fit and we have nice formulae. And at the end, we end up with this signal, which is in blue, to be compared with the data that are in red. So of course, uh, the uh, normalization is tuned so as to account for the, for the data because we have basically no bound. We are still much below the dark matter bound. So we can, of course, adjust the uh, amount of, um, of uh, bouncing black hole. But the interesting point, the non-trivial point, is that the secondary component here coming from the decay of neutral pions and not from the direct emission is subdominant. I was really expecting this uh, second component to be there and this would have spoiled the, uh, the model, but it's, it's small, it is actually small and therefore it works. And it can be distinguished from other signal once again, because the redshift dependence is very specific. Whatever your alternative favorite explanations, either uh, decaying supersymmetric particles or astrophysical pulsars or whatever, they will, they will follow the blue curve and we will follow the yellow curve. So there is a, a clear difference. Uh, all that I have said up to now, relies on a fully deterministic view for the lifetime of black hole. Of course, it's wrong because we, you, you have to think uh, to something like nuclear decay process. It is random with a very, uh, very trivial uh, uh, behavior. And you have to take that into account. And if you do that, although this is very simple mathematics, you, you can completely change the, um, the picture for, for the game. For example, if the initial mass spectrum of your black holes is not wide, if it is peaked, and this is something very physical, because for example, if the um, formation process is associated with a phase transition or something like that, you expect a peaked mass spectrum, not very uh, wide. In that case, you can basically uh, uh, adapt, adjust exactly as you want the energy of the emitted photons. So you can really match the fast radio burst um, at the exact precise value without any um, tension in the model, just by taking into account the fact that the decay is a random process, the stochastic process. And this works whatever the normalization, by the way. You can compare the curves, either normalizing on the number of black holes or normalizing on the mass of black hole, and you end up with the same result. And the other interesting point is that even if you don't have a peaked mass spectrum, but if you have a wide mass spectrum, like in old fashioned primordial black hole models, then you can still make predictions and you have these Zeus predictions uh, uh, exhibited on the left. So of course, the details of the predictions depend on the detail of the mass spectrum, but you have this general trend that the flux uh, is increasing with energy. And it could be that actually the fast radio burst we measure if they were to be explained by this model are only a tail of a more general distribution that is just uh, evading the measurements because we don't have detectors with the sensitivity of uh, radio antenna working at all wavelengths. Okay, so now let me uh, finish with the recent uh, history. The model has been once again refined by the same team plus uh, those uh, other uh, gentlemen. And in, the, in, in this uh, latest version, basically, uh, we um, go back to the usual view that the black hole begins by Hawking evaporating. And when it reaches the Planck mass, we have this uh, usual uh, instant uh, calculation for a black to white hole uh, non perturbative transition. And in that case, um, we end up with relics that are long lived uh, for basically uh, information conservation uh, arguments. So the interesting case for phenomenology that we have recently uh, studied in this uh, paper is when the black holes have already completed their Hawking evaporation, but have not yet decayed and are therefore metastable relics, which corresponds to this range of mass. So initially, uh, Rovelli and Bidotto argued that there could, there could we could have here a very good candidate for dark matter because basically the, the kind of Hubble masses we have at the end of inflation are compatible with what is required for this model to work. And this is correct. But unfortunately, we also have to take into account the huge amount of entropy 
that is released by the evaporation, and this is severely constrained by nucleosynthesis. So if you want to avoid to photo, photo dissociate the elements created during nucleosynthesis, you have very stringent uh, bounds. And when you work out the mathematics, you end up with the uh, conclusion that in an inflationary universe, it doesn't work. You basically cannot make dark matter uh, in, uh, in this way. But it could be- I the same floating questions. OK, thanks. But it could be that it could be for, that, that we are dealing with, um, with black holes from before the bounce, but it doesn't work either because we would need a too high density at the bounce. It could be highly transplantian and, then, and therefore unphysical. But we have this not matter, sorry for the typo, this matter bounce universe that is well known in loop quantum cosmology. And what is interesting here is that we can evade inflation because in the, in the matter bounce universe, uh, we don't need inflation anymore to have a nearly a scale invariant uh, power spectrum. So this is good for this model because the problem was basically coming from, uh, from inflation and the reheating process, etc. And we went through the calculation. Uh, of course, it works by construction if you take into account the stochastic lifetime. So there is uh, always a possibility to survive and to explain dark matter. But what is interesting to me is can we test the model? Can we make predictions? And in that case, uh, you can um, uh, make the calculation by assuming that the, the white hole decay by emitting a single Planck quantum. And this translates into a limit for the initial mass around 10 to the 12 grams. Or you can make the hypothesis that the white hole are emitting a continuous uh, signal. We took an E minus two signal for somehow technical reasons because um, it, it avoids uh, to have a sensitive um, parametric dependence over the bounds of the integral. And at the end of the day, we end up with nearly the same bound of initial, initial mass, which should be greater than 10 to the 11 grams. And if you are interested, we also derive some analytical formulae to uh, evaluate the, the distortion of the initial mass spectrum induced both by the Hawking evaporation and by the bouncing effect. Okay, I'm running out of time. So, um, okay, I skip this. You can also detect maybe the coalescence of such white over leaks and you can calculate exactly the number of emitted events, but you don't know how those events would look like. To conclude, uh, the idea of bouncing black hole is appealing. The phenomenology is rich, but uh, we need more theoretical details at the, um, at the level of the model to really be able to compute a clear signal. And in my opinion, making dark matter with uh, metastable white hole relics is possible, but extremely constrained. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Abai, you have your hand raised. Any other questions? I have not heard anything. Is it is it normal? Yeah, yeah. And Zhong? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So let me just say um, the, the the big thing is really it's very nice um, analysis uh, and very thorough. And but I just wanted to know finally what is the conclusion in your mind? I mean, because you sort of raised very interesting possibilities, but you said you don't believe that this really is explanation for the um, for the fast radio burst. And there are also problems with the uh, with the, uh, the the dark matter candidate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, is the final conclusion then that that this really is astrophysically very difficult to observe or make a case for observ observable signals of the kind that people have been talking about? Okay, so my personal view is that dark matter basically doesn't work. I think you really right. need too strong uh, hypothesis and too unnatural hypothesis to make it work. Uh, for, yeah. the, for the possibility to detect, maybe yes. The problem is that for the Hawking evaporation, we have a very clear understanding of what is happening. We know why the spectrum has the shape it has. And here at this level, we are making guesses, educated guesses, but still guesses. So I don't know. We, we, we will need a better model, which is not yet clear. OK, so you basically agree that at this stage, um, in some sense, there is a uh, roadblock, I mean, uh, to have some something that the community as a whole could put its energy in pushing. There's not nothing sort of which stands out saying as a you know, great signal beacon that we can all follow. Yes, 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 I, I, I agree. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Erlian. We need to move on.
Uh, next speaker is Param Singh, who will speak about the effect of loop quantization prescriptions on the physics of non-singular gravitational collapse. Can you share your screen? So, so uh, can you see my screen now? No. Or, uh, we saw it briefly and disappeared. Okay, just a second. I don't know. Um, okay, can you see now? No. Now? There you go. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to discuss some of the uh, some of the physical implications we have been studying when we change some loop quantization prescriptions uh, while studying the LTB model with homogeneous dust density, essentially looking at the outermost shell. And this is a work which is going to appear this week on archive in collaboration with Christina Giesel at Erlangen and Boffy Lee at LSU. So this is the outline of my talk. I will give a very brief introduction. Uh, Her Kirath has done actually an excellent job of introducing the LTB space-time and the outer dust shell model. So I'll be just uh, latching on with his talk. Then I will quickly go to classical LTB space-time with homogeneous dust in Arstrecker variables. And then uh, the, the talk essentially deals with describing two effective dynamics. The first effective dynamics is based on the holonomy triad quantization, which is essentially what uh, most of the works have been dealing with so far when we are trying to understand the similarity resolution black hole space-times. And the new quantization I'm going to study is the effective dynamics of holonomy and gauge covariant flux quantization. The gauge covariant flux idea was given by Thomas Thiemann in 2000, and it has uh, it had certain motivations which I will come to. And I would like to show that there are uh, though the qualitative features remain the same, there is there is some clear distinct signature which can distinguish the holonomy triad quantization and holonomy gauge covariant flux quantization. I will discuss numerical results because unlike the holonomy triad quantization, the second quantization cannot be handled analytically. It is quite complicated. And then I will summarize. So what is the motivation of this study? So we are all well aware of that uh, in loop quantum, uh, loop quantization of various symmetric models, one of the main results is the resolution of singularities. This was first shown for the homogeneous isotropic space time in spatially flat universe with the massless scalar field uh, in 2006, uh, where we showed that if you start from a large macroscopic universe peaked at the classical trajectory, and if you evolve this universe backwards towards the big bang, then there is a big bounce when the space-time curvature reaches almost a Planck, Planckian scale. Now, the underlying the underlying dynamics of this of these space times is governed by a quantum discrete equation, and uh, it's generally quite complicated to work with that equation in, in a, for different space times. But fortunately, there is an effective space time description which can be used to answer various questions or gain insights in some, some questions. And for example, like there is a generic resolution of strong curvature singularities for all anisotropic and isotropic space times, which, which we showed. These, uh, these techniques have been applied since 2006, thanks to uh, work by work by Hore and Gambini uh, for a very long time. They have been using these techniques to understand various spherically symmetric models. Then these techniques have been applied also in the black hole space times, the Schwarzschild interior and so on, and also LTB space times. In various of these models, there are exceptions where, where the things are different depending on the quantization prescription. But in most of these studies, uh, when you are looking at the scenario uh, of a collapse, or if you look, if you try to imagine a scenario for collapse, then first a black hole, uh, uh, black hole horizon will form, or a trapped surface will form. Then a, it will approach toward a central singularity. Then it will bounce, and then another trapped surface will form, which can, which can be called as a white hole. So a black hole white hole pair is quite common in this scenario, and like if you look at the details of any of these models, that whenever a black hole forms a white hole certainly forms after the bounce. That's always true. In some models, like for example, the model which uh, we studied with Abhyash Taker and Javier Olmedo, like these models have 
the, the black hole and white holes actually form as twins. They have identical mass and identical properties on the both sides. The big question which we are interested in is, well, that it's true that there are these loop quantization or desymmetric models, but loop quantum cosmology or the loop quantization of desymmetric models has so far not been connected with loop quantum gravity. And we would like to understand that if suppose we try to implement further techniques from loop quantum gravity, are these predictions robust when we include all those changes? So that is the main goal of why we want to study more modifications. And one approach which has been used in the last couple of years to connect these symmetric space times to loop quantum gravity is to use coherent states. And these coherent states, the idea then is that you work in certain approximation of loop quantum gravity and which are peaked on certain semi-classical space time and then try to extract from loop quantum gravity or one of its approximation, some space time which is very close to such symmetric space times. Now, if you're working with the coherent states, there are various challenges which arise if you want to use holonomies and triads or fluxes, if you have a fixed discrete lattice. All of these models, which, which have been studied so far in loop quantum cosmology and in, and in the black hole quantization or spherically symmetric models, they are all based on the non-graph changing Hamiltonian or the fixed discrete lattice. If you have a fixed discrete lattice like that, then various issues arise when you are working with fluxes on the coherent states. One of the issues, for example, is that if you look at all, all the gauge transformations permitted in the SU2, then there is no such flux observable you can construct, which is invariant under all possible gauge transformations in the inhomogeneous situation. The second issue which arises is that if you try to work with the vector fields of fluxes, then it is very difficult to work with the coherent states. So a way out was given by Thomas Thiemann in 2000, in which he proposed that, well, we can try to work with the gauge covariant fluxes. And these gauge covariant fluxes are slightly different animals than the fluxes in the sense that instead of, in, instead of just being fluxes, they also have the information about the connection when you're trying to smear over a two dimensional surface. Okay, so now the goal which we have in this talk is that uh, we want to understand the, the the quantization of the LTB space time using the outermost dust shell model using the holonomy triad approach. This work was already done a couple of years ago by Tavakoli and Dapor and Marto. And now we want to compare that with the, with the scenario when you have the, the holonomies and gauge covariant fluxes. So it's a very simple model essentially, but the main message here is that if you, even in this simple model, some of the predictions which we see from the gauge covariant fluxes, so, uh, are very different from when you use holonomies and triads. The main idea is how much is the issue of the gauge dependence when we are talking about the robustness of the predictions. So let me just give you a very brief overview. Her Kirat has already done a great job and uh, I cannot substitute for that. So the classical LTB dust shell model essentially is a spherically symmetric solution in GR with a non-rotational dust. The metric looks uh, is, is of this form, essentially, where R is the aerial radius variable, which depends on X and the dust time tau, which is determined by two Fs, the capital F and a small f, which in the classical theory are given, are determined by these two equations up here. So F uh, by 2G is a total mass within the dust shell of radius X, and small f is the total energy per unit mass of the dust particles. Interestingly, F also determines the local embedding of the spatial slices. When F is negative, then we have a bounded case. When F is zero, we have a marginally bounded uh, case. And when F is greater than zero, we have an unbounded case. Most of the studies in both in the wheeler devitt context or in loop quantum cosmology have dealt with the marginally bound case, which is the easiest case. And I'm going to stick to this case for this talk. So in the marginally bound case, once you have imposed the Gauss constraint, and you want to cast the problem in terms of the architectural variables, then one is left with two pairs, Kx and Ex. The Kx is the extrinsic curvature. The marginally bound case, uh, uh, just recall, is just like a spatially flat uh, FLRW model, essentially. So one can relate the extrinsic curvature with the uh, architectural variable very easily just using the emergency parameter. And so one is essentially working with the connection here, even though it's written as a Kx. Similarly, the the next pair is K phi and E phi, which satisfy this Poisson bracket. And you can recast the metric, the space-time metric in terms of these triads, and it takes this particular form. Now, in the marginally bound case, there are two LTB relations which come out, which were, uh, which were found by Martin uh, Harada and 
Rakesh Tibrewala in 2008. Essentially, if you compare this metric with the previous metric, then the comparing the spatial metrics, one, one gets this relation between the two triads. And if one uses this relation as a gauge fixing condition in the diffeomorphism constraint, then another relation arises between the extrinsic curvature components, which is K5 prime equals Kx. Using all this information, you can write down the gravitational Hamiltonian density, and that H grab turns out to be of this particular form. So this is essentially the point where we have written down the Hamiltonian gravitational density in the in terms of the Ashtager variables. Now the idea is that at the classical level, ex dot does and ex dot does not depend. Ex dot only depends on f and ex, but not its spatial derivatives. So the, what the, the, the implication of this is that if you start from some mass function capital F, and if you're looking at this uh, dust sphere, which is collapsing, and if you divide it into various shells, then these shells are propagating, are going to propagate with the same velocity, and they essentially decouple. And the dynamic of the whole, dynamics of the whole dust cloud can be captured by just of that of the outermost shell. Now, Kiefer and Schmitz, they studied this problem in the ADM variables, and following their approach, like for the Ashtrigger variables, we can write down the action for the outermost shell, which includes a boundary term, where this, this bare epsilon EX or this curly EX is, I'm just relabeling these as capital EX, which is at, which, which corresponds to this very thin outermost shell. Using this action, we can, or from the previous Hamiltonian I showed you, you can obtain this Hamiltonian for the system when with, with the KX and EX being the conjugate variables, which satisfy this, these positive brackets. Now you can look at the Hamilton's equations of, of this Hamiltonian and then uh, unsurprisingly, like those uh, rule of quantum cosmology, it turns out very easily that you get essentially the Friedman and the Rai chaudhary like equations with, for the aerial radius. Uh, R dot square by R square looks like eight pi G rho by three and similarly the Rai chaudhary equation with minus four pi G by three rho. So we essentially obtain a cosmological like model which is enclosed by this outermost shell. Let me come to now the trapped surfaces, which is another information we need. So once we have this outermost shell and this outermost shell is bounding this sphere, then we can introduce two future directed null vectors. And I'm essentially following the approach by Hayward. And in these two future directed, using these two future directed null vectors for the marginally bound case, one can rewrite the metric in this particular form. Now, one can understand the expansion parameter using, uh, using this metric. I'm not going into those details. But if you look at the expansion parameter, then various details can be found. When does a trapped surface form and when does it not form? First of all, a trapped surface forms if the radius decreases along both inward and outward null geodesics. And specifically, when does it form? We can figure out using the expansion parameters. When the bundles of light rays converge on both sides of the sphere, then R dot uh, less than minus one tells us about a future trapped surface or a black hole, essentially. When the bundles of light rays diverge on both sides of the sphere, then R dot greater than minus one tells us about the past trapped surface or a white hole. So this is the interior of this shell. So we have a outermost shell and the dust cloud is inside this shell and we know like when the trapped surface will form or when it won't form. But we can, we also have to match it to the exterior and one can match this exterior to uh, including with the quantum gravity modifications to a generalized Vatia space time. I'm not going to go into the details of the exterior, but it can be matched to the generalized by their space time. Okay, now let, after I have introduced all these classical aspects, let us come to the some quantum aspects and let us revisit the holonomy triad based quantization. And this was, some of this work was essentially also captured by the work by Tavakoli, Marto and Dapot in 2014. One, the starting from the Hamiltonian I showed you, you can rewrite the affected Hamiltonian in terms of the Ashtager variables in this particular form. And then you can find the Hamilton's, you can find the Hamilton's equations and Hamilton's equations essentially uh, can be converted into a modified Friedman-like equation, which essentially, which, which is exactly the same as turns out to be in the spatially flat loop quantum cosmology case, where the rho hole maximum essentially denotes the rho maximum, the maximum energy density of the dust cloud in the holonomy case with lambda square, which is determined by the minimum area gap of the, or around which we are considering this holonomy. Interestingly, there is another way to look at this equation. 
And the, the another way to look at this equation is to pretend that the, 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 all the quantum gravity effects which were coming from the left-hand side, which were exported to the right-hand side, let us pretend that suppose that all the right-hand side in this equation can be written as an effective energy density, such that you mimic the classical Friedman equation. Uh, why we want to do that? Because we want to be uh, as close in interpretation to what will be in the classical effective picture. So one can rewrite this equation in, in terms of an effective energy density, rho effective holonomy, and then this rho effective holonomy can define an effective mass. Now this effective mass is different from the mass uh, which we which we uh, which we which we have seen earlier. This is an effective mass which already includes the quantum gravity modifications, and this effective mass will change as as the collapse will proceed. So the trapped surface only forms when r dot square is greater than one. One can show that uh, from the previous analysis, and in this case, for for you can show it analytically that what it actually means is that the trapped surface will only form when the mass of the black hole is greater than, when the mass of the cloud is greater than m star, where m star turns out to be this expression, which is equal to 0.83 in Planck units. So if you have a mass of the cloud, which is less than 0.83 in Planck units, the trapped surface will not form. The cloud will just collapse, bounce, and then just radiate out without formation of any trapped surface. But if you have a mass which is greater than m star, then the trapped surface will certainly form. And then the then we can see numerically what will happen afterwards. Let us do the same analysis for the holonomy uh, uh, gauge core and flux modification. The, essentially the idea for the gauge core and flux modification ties in some sense to uh, recent attempts to, cons to find out these symmetric models from loop quantum gravity using coherent state techniques. And the challenges in constructing these coherent states using flux and the, and, and, and the triads using the fixed lattice these are all these are all known 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 problems. There is nothing new of what I'm saying here. But these and also that the issue is that these results are gauge dependent for any finite discretization, but they can be overcome using the gauge covariant fluxes. This is essentially uh, Thiemann's idea in the paper QSD seven in two thousand. But it turns out that for these mini superspace models which we are considering, uh, these quantum effects from the gauge covariant flux modifications can be actually summed up in a simple expression that wherever you see the triad, essentially the triad changes in this particular form. The, if you have a square root of the triad and it goes to square root of a triad, time the sink function and some delta x kx by two, where delta x is, is, is essentially your, uh, the length parameter, which will, which will be like lambda later on. So the Klaus Ligner and I studied this kind of an approach for loop quantum cosmology kind of uh, models. And we found that this results in the resolution of singularity like in standard loop quantum cosmology of a big bounce. But generically, the big bounce is asymmetric on the other side. And it essentially amounts to a rescaling of the Newton's constant from one branch to another branch. In the LTB dust shell model, we can rewrite the effective Hamiltonian and, and using the gauge covariant fluxes. And then the idea is that it has this additional term, this the sink term. And unfortunately, what happens is that if you cannot, you can derive the Hamilton's equations from this model, but you cannot obtain the modified Friedman or modified Reichshoffer equations from this model. They are extremely complicated because the one runs into a transcendental equation and uh, one cannot compute further. So one must rely on numerics to make any, any uh, to understand any implications from, from this model. So analytically, the mass cap also is very difficult to say from uh, this expression. Okay, so let me just come to some numerical results now in comparing these two models. Uh, so I'm plotting various figures. First, uh, the ra aerial radius versus uh, versus tau, and then the energy density versus tau, and then the effective energy density versus tau. So effective energy density is essentially a, something interpretational. It, it really has no uh, physical meaning at, if, if, you, if you look at the opinion from my side. In both the quantizations, the, the dust shell avoids the classical central singularity. So that is the main thing. So the classical curve is shown by this black curve. The blue curve shows the gauge covariant flux modifications and the red curve is essentially holonomy triad based quantization. So there is a bounce. You start from a, some large radius. I'm just showing a small snapshot near the bounce. The collapse proceeds. It agrees with the classical space time for a very long time, then both of the the quantizations lead to the bounds, but one can see that the red curve is symmetric, but the blue curve 
is not symmetric to the contracting branch. Similarly, the same thing happens with the energy density curve and the blue curve and the red curve shows significant differences in the expanding branch. One can also look at the questions. Okay, one can also look at the effective energy density and I'm showing here the effective energy density for the red curve, which is the standard Voronoi triad based quantization versus the blue curve, which is the Voronoi gauge covariant flux modification. One can see the asymmetry and one can also see that in both, though both the quantizations are different, the one common thing between them is that at the bounds, the effective energy density vanishes and effectively an external observer will see an asymptotic flat Minkowski space time. Okay, so now let me come to the mass cap. So in the formation of trap surface depends only on the mass and we find the numerically that no trap surface forms in the Horonomi triad quantization when M is less than M star, which is 0 0.83. So I'm showing two cases here when one with M equal to 1.4 in the red curve and one equals M equal to 0.7 in the pink curve. So one can see from the R, only when R dot scale becomes greater than one, a trap surface would form. So the collapse will proceed in the red curve and in this first peak, the first trap surface or a black hole will form. It's a dynamical horizon. So it will form, it will grow, and then it will shrink and it will actually disappear. This dynamical horizon disappears. And then again, after the bounce has happened, another trap surface forms, the dynamical horizon forms. It grows and then it will again disappear at the late time. So, but if you look at the pink curve, you see that no trap surface has formed because the mass of the cloud is less than the threshold. So no, uh, nothing forms. But if you look at the pink curve or the black curve, you find that both the peaks are absolutely symmetric. So whenever the trap surface will form, the next trap surface will certainly form in this holonomic triad quantization and they will have identical masses and identical lifetimes. Okay, now the situation changes in the holonomic gauge current flux modification. There, the idea is that what we find is that no trap surface forms in the contracting branch if mass is less than 0.88 and in the expanding branch, if mass is less than 1.18. So there is an asymmetry in the mass caps for the black hole formation or the white hole formation. And here are these three examples. We can see that in this purple graph, the black hole would form, but the white hole would not form. Also, even when the black hole and white hole form together in this, in this blue curve, the, the, the mass is going to be very different from the white hole mass and their lifetimes are also different. And one can show actually generically, uh, semi-analytically, that a black hole white hole twin is impossible in the holonomic gauge covariant flux quantization. This is the evolution of the effective mass, how the, how the mass will look like uh, uh, in, from, from, from an observer. The, in the case of the holonomic flux quantization, which is the blue curve, one finds that the effective mass of the white hole on the other side, when the white hole is formed, turns out to be two third for the mass of the black hole it started from. Now in the black hole, in the holonomic triad quantization, the bounce is completely symmetric and it is possible to obtain completely symmetric black hole and white holes on the, uh, as the twins. But this is impossible in the gauge, with gauge covariant fluxes because the white holes always lose one third of the effective mass for generic initial conditions. Again, one can show this semi-analytically. So let me just summarize my results. Uh, basically, various studies in loop quantization pro have been done for Schwarzschild interior and LTV space times, and one finds black hole white hole twin systems when the center of singularity is resolved. Uh, the point is that these are all symmetric space times. We still have to probe the connection with loop quantum gravity. We have to implement more techniques from loop quantum gravity. Try to understand. Now, one thing, it's, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it, but if you do it, then this happens. That is essentially the idea that we are try trying to test the robustness of these results if you include more techniques, more potential techniques from loop quantum gravity. So all the studies have, have so far used holonomies and triads on a fixed lattice. This is going to be problematic if you want to connect it to loop quantum gravity. And then if you using coherent state techniques and that one of the motivations is to, if you use these coherent state techniques then the gauge coherent fluxes are one possible choices to do that. And if you do that, then we find that the gauge coherent flux space quantization is never going to give you a black hole white hole twin, irrespective of what initial conditions you start with or what you try to tweak. And it is also possible, this is impossible in the holonomy triad based quantization, but it is also possible that a black hole forms without forming a white hole, even though a bounce has happened. And the mass of the white hole when formed is generically approximately two third of the black hole mass. So I will stop here and take any questions if the time is remaining.
Thank you. I'm afraid we are out of time, so let's move on to the next speaker. We'll have time for questions at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Asier Alonso Bardaji, who will speak about Holonomy, corrections, and effective MIDI super space models. Asir, can you share your screen? Good. Yes, can you see my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And then my PhD studies under the supervision of David Brizuela at the University of the Basque Country. And today I will present our latest results on effective modifications inspired by loop quantum gravity. Okay, so let me summarize first the contents of this work. To make the talk as self-contained as possible, I will start with a brief approach to canonical general relativity in this notation. And our work is centered on symmetry reduced models of general relativity, and more precisely on spherically symmetric scenarios. Afterwards, I will explain the two types of modifications considered here, the inverse triad and holonomy correction and we will apply them to a spherically symmetric model. We will include the dynamics in the form of a scalar field and study the covariance of possible modification. As this procedure will turn out to prevent holonomy correction, we will suggest a more generic approach. In this way, we will obtain a family of covariant constraints that allow for holonomy modifications. We will completely solve the vacuum limit and find an observable of the system. Finally, we will introduce a polymer Hamiltonian that, follow, that follows Dirac's deformation algebra. Okay, I will go quite fast to read soon the main results, but let me just say that we will work with the smear form of the constraints that generate the infinitesimal normal and tangential diffeomorphism. However, recall that in this canonical approach, the explicit covariance of the Lagrangian formulation is here. Nonetheless, these constraints follow certain algebraic rules known as Dirac's deformation algebra that ensure that the theory remains covariant. The third bracket shows that two consecutive normal deformations end on the same hypersurface. We can observe on its right-hand side that the structure function is the inverse of the induced metric. In fact, this is the term that will be affected by our modifications to the classical constraint. As mentioned before, we will focus on symmetry reduced models of general relativity. We will consider one non homogeneous space coordinate, and thus only one component of the shift vector will be non vanishing when taking coordinates adapted to the symmetry. Moreover, we want to consider local degrees of freedom. So, in addition to those related to vacuum, we need at least another pair of conjugated variables. We will introduce the dynamics through a spherically symmetric scalar field. With respect to the phase space, the configuration variables will be the Jastegar connection components, which are directly related to the extrinsic curvature in these mini superspace models, and the components of the symmetry reduced triad. Now, concerning the modifications inspired by loop quantum gravity, we will study, study these two different types. First, recall that the operator associated to the triad contains zero in its spectrum and it cannot be inverted. However, in the full theory, there is a well-established regularization procedure to obtain an operator whose expectation values mimic the classical behavior at large scales. In addition, it presents deviations from the divergences at the small borders. In our effective models, we can introduce corrections to account for that regularization. Second, we have the holonomy corrections. In loop quantum gravity, the connection doesn't have a well-defined operator, and one must consider the holonomy, that is the exponential form of parallel transported connections. These holonomies do have a definite operator, and in our effective approach, we will substitute the connection components with free functions. Remarkably, these corrections are the ones responsible for singularity resolution in cosmological scenarios, and we will be paying special attention to them. 
Okay, here we have the classical constraints in terms of the Azteca variables for spherical symmetric vacuum configuration. And in this case, we know that there are no propagating degrees of freedom, but it is an interesting model, model to show the above mentioned corrections. Let us then consider inverse triad modifications, and we introduce two different correction fun functions, and as shown here, alpha one and alpha two. With um, nevertheless, sorry, uh, only alpha one modifies the 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 algebraic relations. Okay. Regarding allonomic corrections, we substitute the angular components of the curvature with generic factors. Contrary to cosmological scenarios, we find a restriction for these free functions. In fact, in fact, the first one must be the derivative of the second one. When this relation is satisfied, the algebra remains first class and the Poisson bracket acquires a deformation equal to the second derivative of the free function. These modifications can be extended so that they include a kind of improved dynamic scheme as in loop quantum cosmology. But let's now consider dynamical scenarios adding a spherically symmetric scalar field. There is a quite general argument showing the impossibility of including allonomy modifications in the presence of minimally coupled matter field. That is, when there is no dependence on triad derivatives nor curvature in the matter part of the constraint. Nonetheless, we try to bypass this argument by considering more generic relations. In fact, it may well happen that matter and geometric degrees of freedom develop some non-minimal couplings as one approaches the quantum regime. And in addition, one could expect polymerization, usually carried out only for the geometric degrees of freedom, to affect some of the matter variables. So in order to account for these modifications, we suggest the following Hamiltonian constraint with the classical derivative configuration. We substitute the curvature and scalar field momentum terms with a generic free function as shown in blue and include additional corrections in red that may account for inverse triad modifications and non-minimal couplings. Now, if we compute the Poisson bracket between these modified Hamiltonian constraints, we fix, we can fix all analog terms to zero and restrict in that way the form of the free functions F and eta. This procedure leads to the following Hamiltonian constraint. The K functions stand, stand for possible inverse trial corrections and only depend on the radial component of the trial. Remarkably, the dependence on the curvature is fixed up to canonical transformations. This, is, this result strengthens previous studies pointing out the non-covariance of holonomy modifications in the presence of matter fields. However, inverse trial corrections are consistent with the assumption of covariance in this effective model. They deform the bracket between Hamiltonian constraints as shown at the bottom. This is a very interesting model with inverse trial corrections, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we would like to implement allonomy modifications to reproduce similar results to those found in cosmological scenarios. Hence, we extend our assumptions and suggest a general answer, which is quadratic in radial derivatives of the trial components and the scalar field. Here, the Free functions A depend on all the six variables of the model. In order to fix the free functions, we will demand anomaly freedom as in the previous case, in addition to the existence of a classical limit. Regard, regarding anomaly resolution, the bracket D and H fixes the dependence on all densities and demands that, the, that these functions are scalar functions. The bracket between Hamiltonian constraints is a little bit more trickier, but one can finally remove the dependence on KR and the scalar field moment. Moreover, demanding the canonical form for this bracket, one reduces the possibility of modifications through a global factor. Finally, we obtain this constraint that forms a first class algebra whenever the subsequent anomaly equations are satisfied. 
this form a system of highly coupled 11 first order partial differential equations, which involve the remaining 11 free functions. However, looking for allonomic corrections where we are mainly interested in the dependence of the angular component of the curvature. And one can easily see that the freedom involving this variable is very restricted since 10 out of the 11 equations involve a derivative with respect to it. Okay, after seeing that horrible system of equations, let me briefly say that taking the vacuum limit, we have been able to solve completely the anomalies. The Hamiltonian shown here is the most general one that produces an anomaly-free algebra. Two different functions, f and g, represent the freedom to introduce allonomy corrections. A very interesting aspect of this reduced model is that we have found a weak Dirac observable that we identify as the effective mass of the model. Indeed, taking the classical limit, one can check that this expression is precisely the Schwarzschild mass permits rising static black hole solutions. Now we can write the algebraic deformation fu function using this observable. The resulting expression on the right hand side is quite long, but it will be useful in our next step. This step is precisely the addition of the scalar field to the vacuum solution. As we have seen, the anom I, sorry, as we have seen, the anomaly system was very complicated. So we assume that the coefficients of the scalar field part take their classical form. Now discarding solutions that do not involve freedom in the angular part of the curvature, we get the following constraint with only one free function there. The additional dependence of this function on the radial component of the triad allows us to implement some kind of improved dynamics scheme. However, as shown in previous studies, this scale dependence spoils the periodicity of the Hamilton. Hence, sorry, hence uh, let us suggest this following sinusoidal form for the free function. And here we can see in more detail the additional modifications demanded by anomaly resolution. The first terms are the are the usual the usual ones in polymer models. However, the remaining classical terms in the second line appear multiplied by a cosine function. Further, we find two additional second order couplings here in the first line and the last term <clears throat> between radial derivatives and curvature components. The formation of the algebra can be seen below. This model represents a family of effective mini superspaces depending on a free real parameter lambda. With the specific case. Sorry? Four minutes, including questions. Yes, okay. And okay, so the specific case lambda equals zero corresponds to classical general relativity. Let us now implement the previous notion of effective mass, which, by the way, can be extended to this model with math. Just notice that we do not have a proper notion of metric in these effective models, but this expression here tends to the Hawking mass in the classical limit. With this, we can write the deformation in a covariant way using only scalar functions. Moreover, since the deformation must be non-negative, we obtain a lower bound for the, for the radial component of the triad. The saturation of the bound corresponds precisely to the vanishing of the deformation beta. Particularly in vacuum, the effective mass is an observable quantity, and this result ensures that the system cannot reach the singularity. Just to finish, let me summarize our work. So we have checked which corrections motivated by loop quantum gravity still satisfy Dirac's hypersurface deformation algebra in this non-homogeneous spherically symmetric space time. This represents a first step to describe covariant effective collapsing scenarios with holonomy corrections. We have obtained the most general Hamiltonian plus some consistency equations, and the vacuum limit has been completely solved. 
we have uh, obtained an observable quantity, the effective mass. And finally, we have suggested an effective polymeric constraint with phenomenic operations. Moreover, we have been able to give the deformation in terms of the, this effective mass and show that there is a lower bound for the radial component of the trial. Okay, so with this, I will conclude my presentations. If there are any questions, uh, thanks for your time. So Javier, you have your hand raised. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I have a well, I have several questions, but I will just ask one of them. Uh, with this polymerization, do you expect to obtain a effective space time with a signature change? Okay. So here we obtain, for instance, in this one, we obtain that the formation must be non-negative. It's all square, so we do not. We do not expect uh, a signature change. Okay, Th thanks a lot. And, and thank you for your talk. It was very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? So, Jorge, can I ask a question? Go ahead, quickly. So, uh, if I understand correctly, like you are finding, in some sense, a contradiction to the earlier results by Voyewald and his group. Is, am I correct in pinpointing it? Um, you because mean due to the signature change? Because there so, is that with the holonomy modifications, there is no way you can get a covariant Hamiltonian or the covariant picture, but you have found it. As far as I know, those modifications in involving signature change and so on were for a vacuum model. And here we have extended the, the analysis to include these couplings between radial derivatives and curvature components and found uh, an effective model. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We need to move on. Next speaker is Kong Zhang. who will speak about loop quantum Schwarzschild interior and black hole remnant. Kong, can you share your screen? Hello, so can you see my screen? Yeah, but just the background. Okay, good, go ahead. Okay, so at first, so I will thank the organizer so that I can be here to share my work. And this is a work in collaboration with Yung Ge Ma, Shu Peng Song, and Xiang Dong Zhang. So the title of this work is Loop Quantum Schwarzschild Interior and the Black Hole Remnant. Uh, so the quantum nature of black hole is a challenging topic. At first, so uh, at first, uh, this 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 issue can be related to the constitute of dark matter. So if black hole evaporation halted at some stable state, uh, which is referred to black hole remnant, so this remnant would have important cosmological consequence, and they can even comprise uh, the entire dark matter. So moreover, the quantum theory of, of, of black hole is expected uh, to help us to solve the, uh, the, the information paradox. And uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a loop quantum, as a quantum gravity theory, so loop quantum theory has been used, has been used to study the Schwarzschild black hole. A lot of achievement uh, are obtained uh, but I think it is still far from the end. So in our work, so our work, the, the, one of the main difference between our work and, uh, and those work, I think is, is, is that, so we focus on the quantum dynamics rather than the uh, effective dynamics. Oh, sorry. So in our work, so we studied the, we studied the Schwarzschild interior. And this space time can be foliated uh, by, a by a homogeneous spatial slice, which is of topology R cross S2. We use X data and phi to denote the coordinate adapted to this topology. Uh, and in order to avoid the integration divergence, we first introduce an elementary cell uh, which is of length L0 along this x direction. 
Uh, the classical phase space of this model consists of field of Ashtika Barbara variables on the spectral slice. And uh, because of the homogeneity of this, uh, of this spectral slice, so they take these forms. So here, C, B, and the PC, PB are, are all constant. And from this expression, uh, we can see that the classical phase space is actually uh, finitely dimensional, uh, which can be coordinated by the canonical pairs B, PB, and C, PC. Uh, we use the polymer condition to quantize this, uh, this model and to get a Hilbert space consisting of almost a periodic function on R2. So those functions take this form. Uh, the inner product is given by this equation. And from this equation, we can see that those functions per se, mu, lambda, are actually orthonormal basis of this Hilbert space. There are four types of operators, uh, which are PB, PC, and the exponential function of B and C. It can be from this, this, uh, this structure that so in this model, there is no operator B and C in the Hilbert space. And also this Hilbert space is, is non-separable. For the first one, for the first one, it will lead some problem in the condensation of the Hamiltonian constraint. Uh, and for the second one, I think it is, it is like mathematically uh, undesirable. But, uh, but, this, but this problem is actually finally solved by the super selection feature of our, of our model. So this is the classical expression of this Hamiltonian constraint in which there are those variables B and C. Uh, but as mentioned before, so there is no, uh, so these two variables uh, have no operator correspondence. So in order to quantize this classical expression, we need to first do regularization to get some con contestable expression. And this regularization will introduce two parameters, delta B and delta C. So there are, there are a lot of, there, there, are, there are several strategies to choose, to fix this parameter. And a different strategy will give us different operators and therefore lead to different uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, but in our work, uh, we didn't uh, focus on some specific, uh, uh, specific scheme. So rather than focusing on some specific scheme, we just uh, give some general assumption on the scheme. So this assumption is that this C, uh, so this is, this is the most important assumption in our work. So this C um, should be uh, direct observable. So that is to say all of the scheme which satisfy this assumption could be discussed, could be discussed by our analysis. So for instance, this mu naught scheme where one choose delta B and delta C as a constant. And also this, uh, and also this modified scheme where, where one choose uh, delta B and delta C as functions of this, of, of this direct observable M. So this two scheme, uh, can be discussed by our analysis. So we have this, we have this Hamiltonian constraint operator and by our assumption, so this operator is a direct observable so that, so, so it, it commute to the operator H, then we can replace it by its eigenvalue to get this operator M so rather than studying the property of this operator H, we just study uh, the properties of this, of this, of this operator HM. And the, the following two properties will be important in our talk today. So the first one is that, so HM is semi-bounded and it takes only discrete spectrum. So the second one is that HM is an analytical operator value the function of M in, in, in some sense. So based on these two properties, we can actually plot uh, this, this figure. So plot this figure 
to see how the spectrum of HM depends on M. So according to the first one, so it is takes only discrete discrete spectrum and semi bounded. So we can say so for each specific M for each for each specific M. So there should be so the spectrum should be uh, discrete and have a lower bound. And according to the second property, so according to the second property, we can conclude, for instance, that so the uh, the the first smallest eigenvalue of HM for all of M gives us an analytical function. So for instance, so this this right this this right line. So this right line depending on M should be uh, analytical function. Uh, so does for the so does for the for the second uh, low smallest eigenvalue and so on. So we will use this M H M uh, as a notion to as a notion to 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 denote the eigenstate of this H M. So now let us come to the uh, now let us come to the let us come to the to the to the dynamic of this model. So the dynamic of this model is governed by the is governed by the constraint the equation h equals to zero. And according to this equation, so this precise, the physical state per se is either an eigenstate of h with respect to the eigenvalue zero or is zero itself. So from the picture we plot just now, we can see, for instance, for this, uh, for this M corresponding to the corresponding to the black line. So there is no vanishing eigenstate of H associated to this M. So here by vanishing eigenstate, I mean the eigenstate uh, with respect to eigenvalue zero. So only associated to those red dots, to those M with respect to the rest red dots. So there are vanishing eigenstate of H associated to the. So by this analysis, we can say that even though at the kinematical level, those M could take a continuum value, but at the dynamical level, so those M associated to which there is this vanishing eigenstate can only be discrete. So we will, be, we will denote uh, those M by this M O N. And according to the property, according to the analytical property of H M, so it's actually this property, according to this property of M, we can get that this M O zero, so the, 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 the smallest available value of M cannot be, va cannot be vanishing. So, from this result, we state that so our our analysis supports that uh, there exists a stable non-vanishing ground state in this model. So dynamically, there is such a state, and this state we will call the uh, black hole remnant. So our analysis support the existence of the black hole remnant, and actually, so. And those those of those those values of of M associated to which there are vanishing eigenstate can be com can be computed numerically. So those two those two figures uh, shows uh, show our numerical result. So in the first one, uh, we can see the the scheme where dirt B and dirt C are both constant, and in the second one we can see that the scheme where dirt C is a constant, but dirt B is a function of M. And uh, some further work is that, so we can consider the, uh, the model of gravity coupled to a massless scalar field, uh, so that we can consider the relational evolution of the gravitational variable uh, with respect to the, to, the, to the scalar field. And those two, figures plus the dynamics of this model. And uh, so the, 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 the first one is the evolution of the wheel packet. And for the second one is the evolution, uh, is the evolution of the expectation value. Uh, 
So comparing to the comparing to the effective dynamics. So 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 the initial data is chosen to be phi equals to zero. So we can see around of phi equals to zero. The quantum dynamics and the effective dynamics match with each other very well, but uh, at the time phi uh, goes far from from zero. So 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 the match between these two dynamics uh, is not that uh, that's as well as before. Four minutes, including questions. Okay, so so finally, so let me intro, let me let me let me summarize my my work. So in our work, so. Uh, we solve the quantum Hamiltonian constraint of the loop quantum Schwarzschild interior. So the eigenvalues of the, the eigenvalues of the Dirac observable, so which corresponding to the ADMS take discrete uh, eigenvalues at the dynamical level. And moreover, zero is not an eigenvalue of this ob observable, so which supports the existence of a black hole remnant. And also a numerical method to diagonalize the Hamiltonian constraint operator is proposed. Uh, and I think with this method, so we can do uh, more than this. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Any questions? Javier, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank, thanks a lot for your, for your talk. Uh, it's been very nice. So I have a, just a question or a comment about the last point where you compare the um, numerical evolution of the quantum state. Yeah, in the in the upper plot, I think I see that in the rightmost and the leftmost sides, there is like a dispersion, right? That the, the dispersion is growing. Yes, uh, yes. As you, as you move uh, away from five equals zero. So perhaps this is because you are not choosing an appropriate state uh, maybe there is a, some other choices uh, of a state that will help in order to keep the uh, to reduce the, the dispersion. So at the, at the end of the day, semi-classicality will with you with agreement uh, with uh, the effective equations. Uh, just just a comment that perhaps one should choose another state that is more appropriate. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So here we choose the Gaussian state actually. So and I and I think. It, yeah, I agree with you that if we choose some other kind of coherent state, so uh, so this 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 phenomenon uh, uh -huh. may not happen, and so that the the match between these two will be. Uh, yeah, because at, around five equals zero, you, you see that there is a good agreement between effective and 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 the quantum dynamics, right? But yes, it yes, seems yeah. that as you move away from five equals zero, there is some increase in the dispersion, and then the two things disagree. So. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I ask the question, Hori? Go ahead, quickly. So I'm just wondering, like, what? Why are there these bounces? Like, what is being plotted? What is this eta? Like, this is a Schwarzschild interior, right? And ah, so this is this PB. So it is proportional to PB. Okay, so these are the bounces in PB. Yes, this is the bounce of PB. Okay. And and also, so the bond is like here is the model of gravity coupled to massless scalar field. So there are actually two bounds. So, so if we consider the vacuum case, so one of the bounds will one of, one of the bounds is corresponding to the to the singularity, but then there is another there isn't the other bounds, so it will be the horizon. But for this model coupled to massless scalar field, actually, so there are two singularities. So one is this normal singularity, the other is is the is the singularity corresponding to the to the black hole horizon actually. So it becomes also a bounce. But but then isn't it isn't isn't this problematic because this was the problem with the Boimer van der Sloot construction that their model did not distinguish the coordinate singularity from the physical singularity and the universe was bouncing at the coordinate space time was bouncing at the coordinate singularity so why does your model has a right infrared physics uh, I'm sorry I, I didn't understand so point. if your model is consistent then it should then it should not be it should not be causing any quantum gravity corrections at the coordinate singularity no so it is not coordinate singularity okay so the point is like a, so the point is that for black hole so we have this it is a vacuum case and for this vacuum case 
the the horizon is a coordinate singularity. Okay, so you are saying here it is not a here it is. Then why is there a singularity at the horizon if you have a massless scalar field collapse? No, so so this is the classical solution. If you can see the 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 model of gravity coupled to massless scalar field and the massless scalar field does not vanish, uh, and there will no horizon. So instead of the horizon, it will be a singularity. I see. Okay. I yeah, thought you meant there is a coordinate singularity. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. So, so this is this 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 is this this is actually should be separated from the previous work. So, the, for the pre previous work, we talk about the vacuum case, but for this, we I just show some further work uh, with non-vacuum case. Sorry, we need to move on. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alejandro Garcia Quismondo will speak about revisiting the Hamiltonian formalism of the AOS black hole model. Please share your screen. Go ahead. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So, um, as Jorge just said, um, my name is Alejandro Garcia Quismondo, and for the, first, uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be discussing some recent work um, in collaboration with Guillermo Mena Marugan. <clears throat> Um, about the AOS black hole model, which is a black hole solution proposed some three years ago by Ashtekar Karol Miller and Singh in the context of loop quantum cosmology. So um, our objective is to explore alternatives in the derivation of the equations of motion in order to see whether other proposals can be reconciled in some sense with the results um, presented in the original works. So, Why can't I? Okay, so um, let's start with a very brief introduction. So the system that we are going to be focusing on is the interior region of a spatial black hole, which can be foliated by homogeneous space-like uh, Cauchy hypersurfaces. And on these hypersurfaces, we're going to construct our canonical formalism by defining Ashtika Barbero variables, uh, which are bound by constraints that reflect the symmetries of general relativity. Once we particularize these variables and constraints to the symmetries of the system under consideration, we find out that the dynamical information is contained in two canonical pairs, B and PB, and C and PC, that encode um, the, the information about the radial and angular sectors. So um, these four variables are bound by the Hamiltonian constraint alone, which once we select a certain lapse function that I've written here, um, has the following structure. It is given by a constant and multiplying the difference of two objects, OB and OC. These two objects, which I will refer to as partial Hamiltonians for a reason that will be apparent in a second, um, only depend on its respective variables. That is, OB depends on B and PB, and OC depends on C and PC and on two parameters, delta B and delta C, that regulate the introduction of quantum effects in the system, in the sense that when you take the limit where both parameters vanish, um, you recover the Hamiltonian in classical GR. So in absence of any cross-dependence at the level of the, um, of the parameters, these objects, OB and OC, generate the dynamics um, in the radial and angular sectors. And that's why I will refer to them as partial Hamiltonians from here on out. I... Okay, so at this stage, um, one question uh, we might ask is how, how do we choose these parameters? So the simplest option is to choose them as constants in the whole phase space. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have um, arbitrary functions on phase space. So um, these, these possibilities have been explored in the literature before. And in several cases, it has been found that uh, some of these choices lead to physical predictions that exhibit properties that, that are not desirable, such as uh, dependence on fiducial structures or um, appearance of large quantum effects in regions of low space-time curvature. In the AOS model, as I was mentioning before, um, one of the main uh, key features 
is that they select an intermediate path, which consists in fixing these parameters as constant, not on the whole phase space, but along dynamical trajectories. So how can we define polymerization parameters, delta, that behave in this manner? So one option is to select them as functions of constants of motion. And the system provides us naturally with two candidates, namely the partial Hamiltonians, which on shell are equal, which is obvious from the structure of the Hamiltonian, and proportional to the, um, to the mass of the black hole. So um, what the authors of these works did originally is to, to choose these parameters as functions of the mass um, supported, which is supported by, by, um, by the fact that these parameters um, satisfy three properties that they enunciate. Um, and yeah, so in practice, this means that the Poisson brackets um, are ignored in the derivation of the equation of, of the dynamical equations. Um, Borndorfer, Miller, and Münch um, noted that if you instead choose your, your, your parameters to be functions of their respective partial Hamiltonian and don't, and don't forget about the brackets when computing the equations of motion, the results that are achieved are different. So th there was this uh, apparent tension which has motivated our work in the sense that um, what our true intention behind all that I'm going to present now is to see if we can reconcile the results of Ashley Olmedo and Singh with, with, um, with a procedure that has the same spirit of that of Bodendorfer Meleon. So the question is, can we construct a Hamiltonian description where the Poisson brackets of the parameters are explicitly taken into account in the derivation of these dynamical equations while uh, being able to reconcile um, the results with, uh, with the original ones? Well, um, what we argue is that since the two partial Hamiltonians are identical in shell, then we shouldn't be able to tell apart their contributions. So instead of choosing the quantum parameters as, as a function only of the respective partial Hamiltonian, we should capture both our contributions. So choosing a function of both um, partial Hamiltonians instead. So um, immediately we realized that the radial and annular sectors no longer decouple, which was the case in previous investigations. And therefore, um, the, um, the calculation of the equations of motion is going to be affected. So when we compute the time derivatives of the triad and, uh, and the connection variables, we obtain um, that the, the equations that, that, were, that were considered by in, in the original works are now multiplied by a global phase space dependent factor C, which uh, is different in each of the sectors. So the radial equations of motion are multiplied by one, um, by one, what's the word, factor, while the angular ones are multiplied by another one, which is a priori different. So I've written on the bottom of the of the slide, the expression of these coefficients written in terms of uh, delta, which is nothing but the derivative of each partial Hamiltonian with respect to its um, corresponding parameter multiplied by the derivative of this parameter with respect of one of the partial Hamiltonians. So um, given how these factors enter the equations of motion, it's obvious that we can take them to the left hand side and reabsorb them by redefining the time uh, derivatives. So um, we can reinterpret the appearance of these factors as uh, two, a priori different, local redefinitions of time. So um, two new time variables arise that we will call radial and angular time times. And then when we rewrite the equations of motion in terms of these time variables, we recover um, dynamical equations that have exactly the same form as the ones in the AOS model, except for the fact 
they are written in two time variables. So since the idea is to reconcile this result with, uh, with the way it was originally presented, then the obvious question is, can this off shell freedom be used to set both times equal, at least on shell? So this condition is equivalent to saying that we want both uh, sp phase space dependent factors to be equal on shell. And since we would want this dependence, uh, sorry, this equality to be satisfied on the whole phase space, then we need to find a way to cancel the phase space contributions, okay? Um, since the derivatives of the, um, of the um, polymerization parameters with respect to the mass evaluated on shell only depend on the mass, then the only way to make this uh, condition hold on the whole phase space is to take them as vanishing. So uh, the answer to the question that I asked uh, some seconds ago is no, unless we consider parameters that are constant on the whole phase space, which is in contradiction with our initial premise. However, this doesn't mean that, oh, sorry. Uh, however, this doesn't mean that we can't do this um, in a certain limit. And in fact, if we take um, these time variables and write an asymptotic expansion for very large black hole masses with respect to the black mass, of course, uh, we see that the lowest order in these asymptotic expansions coincide, in fact. So in this limit, the two variables um, approach each other and the equations of motion of the AOS model are recovered. So in this asymptotic limit, the solutions that uh, Ashtagar and Medan Singh uh, proposed originally are solutions to all dynamical equations up to subdominant contributions. So the equality condition that could not be made work in general, unless we, we settled with constant polymerization parameters does hold in the limit of large uh, black hole masses. Um, yeah, so, okay, so if we take the definitions of the time variables and, um, and equate them in, in a simple manner, we can integrate them to obtain an equality between two functions of the time variables providing an implicit relation between them. Between them. Um, using the asymptotic expansions that we had uh, computed before, we can in fact extract the relations in the limit of large black hole masses. And not only the leading order term that reproduces the result discussed in the previous slide, that they are equal, but also the next to leading order one, which um, allows us to realize that um, not only are these time variables equal for large masses, um, but also they are equal in a neighborhood of the horizon where the quantum effects are expected to be negligible. So, yeah. Now, uh, to conclude, I just wanted to sum up the main ideas that I would like to, to convey. First and foremost, our objective in this work is to explore alternatives that had not been explored before and that are open to us in order to see whether other proposals can be reconciled with the results of the original model as it was proposed. Mm, the effect of considering polymerization parameters that are direct observables and taking this non-trivial uh, functional dependence on phase space in consideration when computing the equations of motion uh, results in the appearance of two phase space dependent factors, which can be interpreted as local time redefinition. So these two um, time variables are a key feature of the model as it is uh, as it has been presented. These variables, as I said, are approximately similar to each other in the asymptotic limit of large black hole masses, recovering the dynamical equations of the AOS model. So in this limit, um, the original results of the AOS model can be reconciled with our formalism to a certain extent. And I say this because the, the dynamical equations are identical, but they are written in a different um, time variable. So the space-time geometry is modified with respect to the original proposal. Now, um, the interesting point is 
that this might open a door to an alleviation of certain criticisms of the original model, such as its uh, asymptotic behavior and uh, the fall off of the space-time curvature in, the, in this asymptotic region. So that's everything I wanted to say. I've written here the references that I was mentioning and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, it's a very, very nice work. Uh, uh, I feel that um, there's probably some relation between what you found with respect to these two times and what is there in the original AOS paper in Appendix B. Uh, so you might want to just look at it. It has to do with the, determining the parameters and there were some assumptions made there. So it, it might be even further clarifying uh, to, to, you know, to, uh, to what you already said. So that all just a small comment. Mm, certainly, thank you. Sahil. Hi, Alejandro. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, did you explore how this, uh, what you have uh, shown, how this uh, affects the symmetry of the bounds, which was the original uh, purpose of the original model? Yeah, that's uh, some work that has been done uh, as we speak. So that's uh, what, I, what I presented here is just um, this different premise and the exploration of its immediate consequences. But there is a large number of things that are very interesting to us and that we are investigating at the moment, yeah, such as the symmetry, as you said. So under, there, there seems to be some implicit assumption here that the black hole mass in the, in the AOS model and the white hole mass and the black hole mass are identical. That's not true. It is identical only in the large M limit, right? I mean, there are corrections, uh, there are small corrections. So I think that one should keep that in mind. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Uh, next speaker is Saeed Brasgo, who will speak about effective black hole interior and the right chowdhury equation. Could you unshare your screen, please? Yes, it, it doesn't let me. I think the previous speaker should stop sharing. Right now? Yep. OK. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jorge and Param, for organizing this and, and the opportunity. So this is a this is a work that we were um, doing uh, in, with some collaborations. And we were thinking about the uh, probing the structure of the, in, uh, the interior of the Schwarzschild black hole using the uh, expansion and the Richarder equation because uh, Richarder equation is actually the backbone of the Penrose, um, Hawking Penrose singularity theorem. Sorry? Oh, okay. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna brush over the the first few slides, because I think everybody here is familiar with that. I just put them there for, uh, for um, completion. So we know that the interior of the short chip black hole, you can change just when you pass the horizon, T and R, I mean, the time like a space like coordinates change their nature. So you can find that metric by just replacing T and R to each other, changing to each other. And this it becomes the, the metric. And you see that this is a special case of kantovsky sachs model. So interior of the short shield in vacuum is basically a kantovsky sachs model, um, which is a homogeneous and anisotropic model. Um, and as you see here in short shield time, the singularity is short shield time. I mean, that when you're, you choose your laps like this, um, and uh, the singularity happens at t equal to zero, t goes to zero. And the horizon is at two equal to gm, two gm. Um, and if you go forward and, and you want to quantize this system, this is a basically mini super space with finite degrees of freedom. You want to quantize this uh, using the loop quantum gravity. So you write dash the car barbary variables here, uh, spin connection plus the extrinsic curvature. So um, basically the connection you see there and the, and the conjugate to the uh, connection are the, are the um, density as triads. And then you can write these uh, connection and, and this is a triads in terms of two variables, C and D and the conjugate uh, moment of PC and TB. So again, you're in, in final uh, um, dimensional system and uh, the algebra of the, of the connection and the, and the triad becomes, as you see, simple as between B and PB and C and PC, very simple. Um, 
Now, in terms of these variables, you can write, rewrite the metric again uh, with a generic lapse and the generic time, which I called capital T here. And if you go to the short sheet lapse now, so write everything in terms of a small t and your lapse choose the short sheet lapse and compare it with the short sheet metric, you see this, this correspondence here, the JRR component. Um, also, you see the correspondence of PC going to TS score. So you can immediately interpret C, PC as the, basically as the uh, radius of the two spheres collapsing two spheres and falling two spheres. And uh, so uh, using the relation that I showed before, you can see that at the singularity, both PB and PC go to zero. So if you want to study the singularity, what happens at the singularity, you just study this limit. At the horizon, you study the, the other limit. So having this in mind, um, and also if you compute because of the, the, the PC going to zero at singularity, you see that the, the, there is this Kretschmann blowing up at, at PC going to zero. So classically, of course, the, um, the uh, singularity is there. Okay, so you can write that your Hamiltonian in terms of these variables, uh, mean super space variables, and you can go on and quantize it and then uh, act it on some state and get your effective Hamiltonian, or you can just directly replace B and C with their sign of mu B and mu C, B and C. And these are the minimum scale, minimum scales of the minimum scale of the theory. They're, they can depend on the, uh, on the minimum area and loop quantum gravity, which is called delta here. And uh, your Hamiltonian at the end, after doing all of this process, your effective Hamiltonian becomes this, this Hamiltonian that you see here. So we are going to work with this Hamiltonian, but in, in the gauge where lapse is chosen like this. The reason that we choose lapse, as, as you see here, is that uh, the equations of motion of C and PC decoupled from B and PB is much easier to solve them. Um, so uh, now uh, we are going to consider this system in three schemes. These schemes basically come from loop quantum cosmology um, to, to you know, considering the classical limits which match the, the classical cosmology or the asymptotic limit. So basically you have three schemes or more than that actually, but uh, the main three schemes are where these mu's are constant or they depend on some scale here and delta and PB and PC, or they have different dependence uh, as you see here. So these are called mu bar and mu bar prime schemes. Um, so in some models, mu bar prime is, is I mean, um, leads to the correct theory based on, you know, a synthetic limit and the, and the classical limit, all that, like Bianchi, uh, Bianchi models, et cetera. So we are, in the black holes, we don't know which really, because we don't have access, experimental access to the interior of the black holes, so we don't know which scheme really works. We are going to consider in this work all three schemes. Okay, so... Now that quickly we have uh, passed this, that uh, well-known part, let's go to the Richarder equation and the singularity resolution. So uh, the Richarder equation basically is a purely geometrical identity that describes the congruence of geodesics, how they converge or focus and defocus or deconverge um, or, or diverge. So let's take a congruence of geodesics and then let's, let's say the, uh, the cross section of this congruence is a circle. So you will have the, you know, the expansion of the circle, which is called basically expansion, you will have this change of shape of circle to ellipse or some other shape, this is called the shear, and you have the rotation or vorticity, which basically rotates or twists these, these geodesics. So there are three important phenomena here that can be seen actually later in the Richarder equation. Um, and this is basically the backbone of this equation of the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorems. And uh, if it leads to caustic points, basically it means that if your coordinate system is not uh, bad at that point, it means that you have singularity at that point. Okay, so as you see here, the left-hand side, this, this theta here is the ex expansion that I mentioned. So expansion exp tells you if this circle is expanding or, or contracting. Uh, the shear term here is corresponding to this uh, change of shape and the vorticity term you see here. So this is the shear term, vorticity term. And finally, you have a tidal tensor, which is related to the energy conditions of the model when you have matter. Uh, in, the, in our case, we don't have any matter, so we don't, uh, we don't worry about that. And in the left-hand side, you have the rate of change or rate of focusing or defocusing of these, uh, these congruence of geodesics with respect to the proper time. Okay, so as you see here, uh, these three terms that have negative negative sign, they contribute to focusing. So 
this only vorticity contributes to defocusing and that's because of the nature of these three terms the nature of attractive nature of gravity and uh, immediately you can qualitatively see why singularities form in, in GR. So in our model, uh, we don't have any matter. And uh, in, we know that in kantowski sachs model, if there's no metric perturbation, the vorticity is zero. So our Ray Chatter equation for the interior of the black hole turns out to be a simpler version without just with two terms on the right-hand side. And these two terms are both negative. So classically, yeah, we are doomed to have singularity, basically or caustic point at least. Okay, so what happens is that now we are going to uh, consider theta and sigma squared that come from modifications to, uh, you know, to our model based on polymer quantization. So uh, let's see, uh, uh, let's take a count of the sex metric in this form, and uh, we choose a family of null uh, radial geodesics. Uh, as you see here, actually, you need two sets of null geodesics, but uh, for, for expansion, you only need that, that's enough. Um, and then if you find the, the uh, ex null expansion corresponding to this family of null radial geodesics, you see that the sigma squared goes to zero and uh, theta becomes this form. So you need the equations of motion to find theta at the end because you have this y dot here. In, in our case, it's PC dot. And uh, so this is the, the form of the null uh, expansion in our Case. So you can basically also go ahead and take the derivative of this respected primer time and find the Ray Chatter equation, the full Ray Chatter equation. Okay, so um, At, at zero, at time equal to zero. So that means that you have singularity, no surprise there. Um, and uh, so there's only one horizon, which is the horizon, the, the black hole's horizon. However, if you go to the mu not scheme, what happens is that, so you have two figures here. This, this figure is the full from zero to two GM. This is just some part of, so just a zoomed uh, part of this, this case. So you see that, um, you see here the expansion, the effective expansion. And then the blue line here is the classical expansion. The classical expansion, you see that both of them kind of follow the same path until very close to the singularity or what used to be the singularity. And then they, they really uh, drastically diverge uh, from each other. Uh, the same goes with the Ray Chatter equation and its effective version. And here is the PC that I mentioned, the radius of the two spheres. We know that in this model, the PC bounces in the UNATA scheme. So there's a bounce here, this, uh, but it's, very, it's not very clearly seen to there's a bounce in the PC uh, in this bouncing model. The point that the bounce happens exactly or the time that bounce happens is this line. And surprising, or maybe not surprisingly, we see that the exact point that, you know, that ex the, the expansion goes from negative to positive and it becomes zero at this point, usually zero, when expansion becomes zero and changes sign, that signals the horizon. But in this case, because uh, we have uh, this, this bounce here, this corresponds to this bounce at, at the PC, and you see that the Ray Chatter equation itself also, so there's no blowing up of the Ray Chatter equation nor the expansion. And uh, there's an, an additional structure, as you see here happens, something here happens, and the expansion, uh, becomes positive, but then it goes, both of them go to zero. So there is no singularity at all anywhere in the, in the interior of the black hole. Um, and what happens is that you get, if you write the formula, you see that analytically, actually, um, in this case, you can do that. You see that you will have uh, corrections. So there will be some negative terms on the right-hand side of the Ray Chatter equation, but will the corrections corresponding to mu um, B and mu C appear there that are that are negative uh, that are positive actually. So the original terms are negative; these are positive, so they overcome. Uh, but this um, actually is um, is uh, something. I think I was disconnected for a second. But anyway, so um, this happens uh, based on these mu B and mu C. And also, uh, one thing that we note is that. Um, Apparently, the Ray Chatter equation and the connection, uh, uh, sorry, the expansion know uh, about the bounce before PC. So, this is where PC knows about the bounce, but the deviation from the classical version of the theta and d theta or d tau happens before the bounce. So, um, four minutes, including questions. 
Okay, so we go to um, the mu bar scheme. You see that in the mu bar scheme, all, everything is, is uh, happening the same. So again, you have this uh, behavior very uh, close or similar to the, to the mu not scheme. Um, but the interesting thing happens in, in the other scheme, the mu bar prime. And you see that in mu bar prime scheme, what happens is that, uh, so you have actually four points in which uh, the, connect, the expansion changes sign, so it becomes zero. So usually, again, we uh, correspond them to horizons. So one might actually ask, does this uh, reveal a structure inside the black hole in this scheme that has like four horizons inside, apart from the, the, the event horizon that is outside? Um, well, it, it remains to be seen. We have to consider the full space time actually to get a better understanding of this, but this is an interesting result nonetheless. Um, and again, you see that in all of these three models, neither theta or nor the d theta to d tau blow up. And, and that uh, is a probably more definitive version of, of like based on somehow Penrose Hawking theorems that there is no singularity in this model. So quickly, let me summarize. Um, I would just wanted to mention that uh, the, the theta can probe the structure of the interior of the black hole probably is an additional or alternative approach to, do, to probe this structure. And, uh, and we have also studied GUP models, generalized uncertainty principle models, and they have exactly the same behavior as mu naught and mu, uh, mu bar scheme uh, um, um, properties. And then we are going to, uh, the, the work that we are going to uh, currently considering are full space time and uh, that models do not have bounds and also effective, the, the models with, with matter um, collapse that are uh, open harmonic other models in this case. Thank you. Questions? Okay, if there are no questions, let's move on to our next speaker. So please unshare your screen. So we have Patrick Fraser who will speak about how classical are Gaussian states and loop one cosmology. Mm -hmm. uh, can you guys see my screen all right? Yeah, I'm just gonna make it full screen. Awesome. Uh, yeah, okay, so thank you all very much for having me here. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm really excited to share this work with you guys. Uh, as was said, I'm going to be talking about a particular issue that's intended to kind of press our intuitions um, about how we think about Gaussian states. And this is based on a recent paper as well. So to just kick off the motivation for this, uh, we typically don't observe fundamentally quantum features of space-time, right? This is kind of why empirical tests of theories of quantum gravity are so hard to come by, because when we look at cosmological phenomena, they don't immediately jump out as being quantum. So, if loop quantum gravity is intended to provide an adequate picture of reality, it must have a semi-classical sector that recovers certain cosmological phenomena in the appropriate limits. In particular, loop quantum cosmology ought to admit the existence of some semi-classical states. <laughs> and this is kind of what I want to explore here. So uh, we're going to say that a quantum state is kinematically semi-classical if it satisfies the following two criteria. First, it should ap approximate a state having a definite coordinate. And second, it should have small quantum fluctuations in the, the canonical observables of the theory. And of course, these are whatever the canonical observables happen to be for the relevant quantum theory. Uh, and these are not intended to be exhaustive conditions, rather they're, they're just necessary conditions. And the reason that I'm specifying that we're acting at the kinematic level is because even at the kinematic level, prior to all the uh, complexities due to dynamics, we actually start to see some unusual and unexpected behavior already. Um, so, okay, when are fluctuations small? Well, ideally, this would mean that the, the joint fluctuations in the canonical observables vanish. Uh, this, of course, happens in classical mechanics. You've just got a single point on phase space. However, as we know from the uncertainty relation, there's always going to be a finite lower bound to these fluctuations whenever you have non-commuting canonical observables. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the Heisenberg relation. Uh, there's actually a more general version of this called the Robertson-Schrodinger inequality, which is just a more generous lower bound. Uh, but it's essentially, it's conceptually the same thing as the Heisenberg relation. And so for this, for our purposes here, we're going to say that the fluctuations of a particular state are small, just in case they saturate this Robertson-Schrodinger inequality. So that's just to say they're small if they're minimal and as small as they possibly could be. 
In traditional quantum mechanics, Gaussian wave functions satisfy these basic criteria quite straightforwardly so, right? If you just look at a Gaussian state, you can tell that it's sharply peaked. So you can tell that it approximates a good, uh, uh, perfectly specified state and position. And it's a standard textbook problem to just show and compute that the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relation is saturated and thus uh, Gaussian states have minimal fluctuations. So by our conditions, they're semi-classical in the appropriate sense. Uh, the question that I want to ask here, though, are, is, are Gaussian states semi-classical again uh, in the context of loop quantum cosmology? And to foreshadow things a little bit, the answer that I'm going to give is, I hope somewhat surprisingly, no, uh, not even at the kinematic level. Now, if I were to just leave it there, it might seem as though I'm somehow challenging the possibility of there being uh, some sort of semi-classical sector in, in loop quantum cosmology. That's not the goal of this. Uh, in fact, it, it'll also be shown that uh, Gaussian states are uh, asymptotically semi-classical in the relevant sense. So you can get as close to being semi-classical as, as you'd like. Um, they're just not exact. So, um, oh, and I see, is there something in the chat? Uh, oh, never mind. Um, okay, so just to set the stage for this a little bit, if we go back to just the usual construal of loop quantum cosmology, I'm just gonna help, I think this will help dialectically here. Um, if we just consider an FLRW space-time where we've got this metric given by a scale factor, then the spatial volume on any particular time slice is given by uh, V equal to the cube of the scale factor. And then the Hubble parameter uh, together with the volume form a pair of canonical variables from which uh, the Einstein field equations may, write, may be derived using the Hamiltonian treatment of the whole stack. And then LQC is just the theory we get when we apply loop quantization methods to these uh, canonical observables for volume and Hubble parameter. So just as an important note, when we do this quantization procedure, uh, or when we do this Hamiltonian treatment, uh, the whole stack action has a divergent symplectic term, as is well known. Uh, and therefore, the loop quantization procedure requires the introduction of some volume regularization. Uh, one therefore considers loop quantum cosmology on a compact fiducial space-time region with some finite volume v naught. And this regularization is very well motivated because if you're in a homogeneous space-time, it really doesn't matter where this uh, where this uh, compact cell is located. So this is quite a quite a reasonable thing to do. And then when we define our, our observables to, to get this theory quantized, the coordinate observable that uh, we take in LQC, which is the substitute for position, is uh, given by volume, and it's defined with this volume operator, which is the usual thing that everyone expects. However, as is well known, uh, the loop quantization procedure does not allow for a unique uh, corresponding conjugate momentum uh, that one would typically expect. So instead, we choose the conjugate momentum to be this S lambda operator, which is uh, determined by the holonomy operator, and it's kind of like the sign of, of beta if such an operator beta existed. Uh, and this is a more natural way to go about defining canonical observables in this uh, loop quantization setting. And note that the holonomy uh, shift is actually dependent on the volume regularization that we've picked. Uh, that'll play an important role in what follows. Also, I'm just going to absorb all of the fundamental constants of the theory into one uh, for ease. So then the, the Hilbert space that we're concerned with is the kinematic volume Hilbert space. It's this polymer Hilbert space. Uh, with these countable superpositions of uh, classical geometries, essentially, and with the usual boundedness condition. And here, uh, a ket with a, a sort of a classical geometry given by a volume Vn, where Vn is any real number, uh, the sign of that uh, volume indicates the orientation of the relevant space, spatial slice. Uh, and then it, it, it's, it's thought that physical states in loop quantum cosmology ought to have a parity symmetry, at least at the kinematic level, uh, in which you can't distinguish between uh, the, two, the different manifold orientations. So we ought to have this condition satisfied as well. Now, with this all in mind, to find a good Gaussian state in this framework, uh, centered around some absolute volume mu, uh, what we do is we basically do the following. So we start by fixing a, a discrete lattice of Planck length in, in, this, in this volume Hilbert space, uh, which I'm going to take to be one uh, from here on. And what we do is we take a superposition of two different Gaussian modes, one of which is centered at the positive volume mean and the other one with, uh, is centered at the negative volume mean. And what this does is this allows us to write down a Gaussian state uh, where the absolute volume looks like a Gaussian state, but the uh, 
the actual volume when you take into account orientation still allows for this parity symmetry. Uh, now by construction, these Gaussian states are sharply peaked in the appropriate sense around this absolute volume. So in order to determine if they are semi-classical kinematic states, we only require that their fluctuations in V and S lambda are minimal. So if we go ahead and, and calculate the exact volume fluctuations for these states, we get this expression. Um, to get the exact expression without any sort of expansions or cutoffs, uh, uh, there's a useful trick, that, which is to just make use of the Jacobi theta function. Um, as an aside, so the Jacobi theta function is defined in this way. Um, I've not seen this in the literature, maybe I've missed it, but I, I've not seen it before. I, I think it's a really useful tool for studying Gaussians on lattices, uh, as should be obvious from, from its, its functional form. Um, but a lot of mathematicians have uncovered a lot of very well-known analytic results about this function, as well as uh, it now has very well-defined and well-behaved numerics. So it, it's a very useful tool for this kind of thing. If we plot the absolute volume fluctuations uh, as a function of the variance of the Gaussian state, we get this uh, completely unsurprising behavior where we see that as the width of the Gaussian increases, the variance in volume uh, also increases. Not all that surprising. There's a bit of strange behavior going on for the, the, the sharply peaked states uh, with when you take different means. Um, but overall, this isn't a terribly surprising thing to see. However, things get more complicated when we start looking at the exact uh, holonomy flux fluctuations in S lambda. Uh, and there's actually two different cases that we have to consider. So the first case arises when this value two alpha lambda on V naught is non-integer. And when that happens, the uh, holonomy shift operator stops being closed on the lattice upon which these states are defined. And so a ton of different terms in this uh, expression just cancel because the, the inner product just vanishes. Um, because you're just shifted off of the lattice. So then you get a very simple expression uh, for these exact fluctuations. Uh, however, uh, if this value is an integer, which I've now labeled k, uh, you get a much more complicated expression. And with this much more complicated expression, again, you can see uh, I've made use of these Jacobi theta functions and, and they, are, they make this a lot more straightforward, uh, especially if you wanna get good plots of things and, and get good numeric results. Um, so if you plot the exact fluctuations in this case for the um, for the quantity flux for S lambda, what you end up getting for various values of k, because k encodes the relation between lambda and v naught, uh, you get that they all converge from above to one over four. Uh, and additionally, you see that as k increases, they just converge more slowly. But they they all they all fairly rapidly converge to uh, to one over four. So the, these fluctuations are essentially constant in this context for most uh, for most cases. Now, the question is whether or not the product of these fluctuations is equal to the lower bound of the robertson schrodinger inequality. Um, there turn out to be three different cases to consider here. I'm not gonna go through the calculation because it, it's entirely routine, but it gets rather cumbersome and, and it's just frustrating to keep track of everything. Um, but all the details are spelled out in the paper. And basically the three cases uh, lead to different behaviors of the, of the fluctuations. So the first case is when alpha lambda on V naught is not an integer. As I mentioned before, what happens here is the holonomy shift stops being closed on the relevant lattice. Um, so that's the first case. And then the other two cases are when it is an integer and whether it's even or odd. And this turns out to affect whether or not uh, the square of the holonomy operator is closed or, or open on, on the relevant lattice. And that determines uh, the behavior of these, uh, of, of the lower bound of, of the fluctuation. So in all three cases, the important result, which I haven't really shown in detail here, uh, but which is in the paper is that all, in all three cases, the fluctuations never saturate the robertson schrodinger inequality. Uh, so there are no values of, of the relevant scalable parameters you know, the, the width, the parity symmetric mean, the holonomy length, uh, there's no choice of those values that actually minimize the uncertainty relation in any th of the three different cases, which should be, I think, somewhat surprising. Um, now, if we actually plot this in the case where we've got an even integer, this is the case where the lower bound is, is highest. So this is kind of the strictest case where you get closest to saturating the bound. Um, if, I, if we plot the difference of the fluctuations from this lower bound in this case, we see that we just get monotonically increasing functions, uh, even, even for small values. We see everything grows very rapidly. Um, it grows more slowly, the, the, fluctuate, the, the difference grows more slowly as you increase uh, the value of K, um, but nevertheless, we never saturate the lower bound. 
The conclusion for this is that unlike in traditional quantum mechanics, Gaussian states in LQC do not minimize the uncertainty relation. Thus, they are not strictly speaking semi-classical in the exact sense spelled out at the beginning. Now, a natural follow-up to this is, well, are there conditions under which they are essentially semi-classical, right? And uh, fortunately, the answer for this is yes. So one can check uh, in the V naught goes to infinity limit that the fluctuations and also the lower bound in this setting, uh, they both vanish. And this is uh, this confirms a, a very nice uh, analysis by Ravelli and Wilson Ewing uh, in this paper, um, which basically was analyzing the phenomenology of what happens in that setting. Uh, so this is really nice. It says that we actually do kind of get some semi-classical states or states that look as semi-classical as we'd like, um, even if they're never exactly there. Um, however, there's an important remark here, which is that even though we get these sort of this asymptotic behavior, uh, in any given fixed model of loop quantum cosmology, because we've imposed this regularization procedure, we have to fix V naught. So V naught has to take on some fixed finite value. And you can look at what happens to your model as that value changes, and you go to new models with larger, uh, larger fiducial volumes. Um, but nevertheless, it has to be fixed within a given model and it has to be some finite value. So you can't actually like reach the, the V naught to infinity limit. So uh, this has some ramifications. Summarizing the main ideas uh, from all of this discussion. Uh, the first thing is that for a Gaussian state with a fixed width and a fixed parity symmetric mean, one can always choose a model of loop quantum cosmology with a sufficiently large fiducial volume such that the fluctuations of that particular state become negligible and, and essentially vanish. Uh, so this means that uh, for any Gaussian state, there's a model of LQC uh, chosen by the value of the fiducial volume such that the, uh, that state is as close to semi-classical as one could like uh, in accordance with the, the very loose standards for semi-classicality that I've set here. Uh, the second uh, conclusion from this, however, kind of balances things in the opposite direction. And it says, well, within any fixed model of LQC where we've got some finite fixed uh, V naught, uh, one can always find a Gaussian state with sufficiently large variance such that its fluctuations are arbitrarily large, which means that in any model of loop quantum cosmology, there's always Gaussian states that are as non-classical as, as one could imagine, uh, where non-classicality is cached out here in terms of just negating semi-classicality. So that kind of says, well, okay, Gaussian states whether or not a particular Gaussian state is semi-classical or no, highly non-classical really depends on the choice of fiducial volume compared against the variance of, of that state. And so th there's actually a lot of data encoded in the, in the width of a Gaussian state about that uh, with, with respect to a particular model. Um, and then the last conclusion here is that there's a, a highly non-trivial relation between uh, the holonomy length lambda and fiducial volume one introduces for, for regularization uh, and this, this relation plays an important role in determining the phenomenology of loop quantum cosmology. Namely, uh, this ratio determines whether or not the holonomy operator is closed on the relevant lattice where the states have been defined. Uh, and additionally, in different cases where this, uh, um, whether or not this ratio is an integer or a non-integer determines a lot about how the, uh, how the various fluctuations behave for the canonical observables. Um, that's everything I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. I should also extend some thanks to Francesca Vidado, Ed Wilson Ewing, and Carlo Ravelli for some really insightful discussions on this topic. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much. Questions? Where can I ask a question? Go ahead. So there was a study by Alejandro Corici and uh, Edison Montoya like about 10 years ago and they looked at very similar issues, I, if I remember their paper correctly. Do you have some comment on their work? Because that work seems to be in, they didn't, they didn't analyze the RS relationship, but you seem to say like the robertson schrodinger relationship affects then their results, if that conclusion is correct. Um, so if I recall, there's several papers by Karichi and Montoya, and um, it's been a little while since I've, I've read them, so I, I can't remember exactly details from those. Um, but it seems basically what happens is uh, in most of the papers that I've encountered with this, uh, oh, so, so I think they were considered more, they, they might have been more concerned with like a continuum limit or something, I think. 
uh, I've, I've forgotten the details of that of that paper in particular, but the um, what happens is a lot a lot of the times when people do this analysis, they take they take these limits, which are very well motivated limits, right? Like the 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 large v naught limit is very well motivated. That's the whole point of doing this regularization in the first place is that we want to end up taking it to be very large, um, and that's all well and good. What I wanted to zoom in on was uh, so there's a, there's a lot of robust analysis that suggests Gaussian states and related states are very close to being semi-classical. And for all intents and purposes, they can be treated as such. What I wanted to do is basically zoom in and say, well, okay, very close, but actually in a meaningful sense, not exactly. And so I, I kind of wanted to highlight that, yes, you can, you can run this story and get these nice approximately semi-classical states and people have done that before, um, but there's a lot of assumptions that are, are cooked in there and it's not immediately, uh, it, it, it's not a, for free. You don't get that for free is basically what I, what I wanted to say there. Um, okay, thank you. Sahil. So, hi, Patrick, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So usually in LQC, we expect uh, things like the fiducial cell, the exact value of the fiducial cell volume, et cetera, to drop out from the physically relevant quantities. So, or in other words, we can say we construct the quantities in such a way that the fiducial, any dependence on fiducial uh, quantities drops out. So uh, what do you think about that in this case? Because here the result depends crucially on the V naught or the actual value of V naught that is taken. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so what happens a lot is uh, uh, people will redefine their, their, uh, their coordinates such that they, they absorb factors of V naught. And so really what, what happens there is then uh, the dependent, the explicit dependence on V naught often drops out, um, but it, it's still implicitly hidden in there. So like you might rescale, um, you might rescale things such that that gets absorbed into another parameter. But for instance, the, the ratio between Lambda and V naught, uh, one procedure one might take would be to just make a change where you swap lambda with lambda over v naught and call it lambda tilde or something like that. Um, when you do those kinds of tricks, that's that's a, a formally precise thing to do, um, but there's still something going on in the background there. Uh, and what you end up getting is like, uh, the, the value of that ratio is still present even after you've absorbed it into your coordinates. So it still plays a role there. I know there's also work somewhere, this actually might be from the Carici and Montoya analysis that show it that this uh, fiducial volume uh, scaling with respect to that, that's not, a, that's not a gauge symmetry. Like that's not something that, it, you can't just totally ignore it. It actually does make a difference to certain parts of the theory as well. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, yeah. Okay, just one more thing. Uh, can you please remind me what was lambda? Uh, uh, lambda is like the holonomy length that, so when you, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, bye. Yeah. So I think just uh, to, there was a little bit of cross communication between the last two, uh, between the, uh, the speaker and uh, between Patrick and, and, and uh, Sahil, I think. Um, when one says in loop quantum, these, these results should not depend on the, on the traditional volume. Those are issues about dynamics in the sense of, uh, if you actually take uh, something like the, uh, the bounds density or something that should you should not have sort of bounds density to but that depends on some reg, infrared regular regulator which is v naught um, but in any case it, the, the results here are just kinematical results they are not really dynamical results and there of course there's no problem in things depending on v naught but my my, my main thing is that my, my main comment was real, uh, this real for a very nice analysis that you are done patrick but i, I kind of feel that you started with a particular definition of semi-classicality, which is very fine, which is good, and said that those that definition is not really satisfied in certain uh, conditions when V naught is not uh, large. Uh, but typically, in fact, what one does is uh, in, from physical consideration that for large system, like in you know, a tennis ball or something like that, the reason why we say that the Uncertainty principle is this, this, you know, while is not violated, it's very good, is met very good. Is really we can compare things like 
the uncertainty is the expectation value. Now, this is something that is to be done carefully because you cannot just, because expectation value can be zero, for example. Uh, but I think that in the, in the case of the volume and the holonomy, something similar has to be done to see physically what is happening. And the, and the, 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 the basic point you're drawing, which is very mathematically sharp and precise and beautiful, is really nothing much to do with loop quantum cosmology. It really just has to do with all, taking certain operators, which are not like X and P, but more like um, P and E to the R lambda X. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that, and the question is, if you take our operators like that, then the uncertainty principle have this, this, these interesting properties. Uh, but that I think is not a, um, to me, it, it's, it's very good to have mathematical precision, but to me, it is not really an obstruction to anything because holonomies are uh, like e to the i lambda x. And, mm -hmm. No, I, and so, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that uh, the, way to, the way to interpret this result should not be, this shouldn't be viewed as any sort of obstruction to, to, to any theoretical results because- exactly. uh, as, as you very rightfully note, that uh, in, the, in, in the appropriate limits wh where we take things to be physical values, uh, this is a perfectly, getting as close as you'd like to the lower bound is excellent. Um, I think that really the, the takeaway from this should be that uh, the intuitions one carries forward from traditional quantum mechanics uh, cannot always be thought of reliably as, as faithfully representing what happens under a novel quantization procedure, which as you noted, is, is ultimately a question about um, expecting something from one kind of Hilbert space to carry forward in another kind of Hilbert space with different operators and all of that. And so the actual original uh, place where this project started was kind of the, the, the noti noticing that Gaussian states in ordinary quantum mechanics structurally are pretty much invariant under Fourier transforms. But then when you go to this other Hilbert space, uh, I mean, they, they don't look quite the same as, as they originally do when you right. take a Fourier transform. And that to me seemed a little bit fishy. And so I thought there might be something going on there. Um, and this is where that took me, so. Yeah. And, and all your results actually also are valid for something like lattice gauge theory results. Um, right. You know, one, mm -hmm. can, one can do the same thing in, in, in that case. But it really has to do taking the holonomy and yes. say electric flux or something as a basic variable. And this E to I lambda X is what makes all this different. But I really yeah. like your analysis. It's very beautiful. It's very clean. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Param. Yeah, some of my comments already have been made, but I, I would like to add a couple of things. So I think like, uh, again, like I reiterate what Javier has said, like I think this is a very useful analysis, very, very insightful. Uh, the, but what I understand from here is that your analysis is also trying to point out that if one considers compact spatial manifolds, then one is in a bigger trouble than if you had a non-compact manifolds, right? Um, yeah, so, so sort of. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're considering a compact space-time just at a kinematic level, then of course, there's no need to regularize anything. You, you, you're given a, a finite volume and you can run with that. Um, in that case, what happens is you can't really take this limit anymore, um, but you can still get very, you, you can still get arbitrarily close uh, provided uh, you can get arbitrarily close to that lower bound, provided you take the variance to be uh, sufficiently small in most cases. Um, I mean, it'll, there's also a bit of a dependence on the, on this parity symmetric mean and a little bit of dependence on on lambda, but uh, you kind of have analytic freedom to, to take, if you just take the variance to be smaller, um, you can still get very, you can still do very, very well, even if V naught is, is fixed to be uh, perhaps not as big as you'd like it to be. Um, Another, another thing that you can, something I haven't really gotten into yet that I, I'm hoping to do more of an analysis on is to look at what's the, what's the actual, uh, given a finite, like given a fixed V naught and a fixed Lambda, uh, what's the best you can do, right? So what's, how close can you get to zero uh, in those cases? And then maybe look at physical estimates for like, okay, uh, with a reasonably large space time, a uh, reasonably large, uh, fiducial volume and a reasonable length of polonomy length, um, how, how small can you actually get physically? I think uh, and I think the answer to that will probably be that even in compact space times that are large, uh, you can do very, very well. You, so by any sort of, like any sort of measurement point of view, it'll be a negligible, uh, a negligible non-zero value. Mm -hmm. But I think like mathematically speaking, like your arguments 
are of direct relevance to actually the paper which you cited by Carlo and Edward Wilson because they were exactly taking the compact spatial manifold and then they were trying to understand somewhat these properties. They were they were not doing these mathematical mathematically sharp things, but their mm -hmm. main point was that if you have this manifold and if you are able to take this limit, then they can explain the effective why effective dynamics works. So yeah. your your results actually directly affect their results in certain ways. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so one of the other uh, one of the places where again this was kind of kind of part of the inception of this project after I'd started thinking about Fourier transforms was uh, in that paper they do a, a really I think a really wonderful analysis uh, once you take this limit as v naught becomes very large and they say supposing that you saturate the lower bound of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Yes. Uh, yeah, if you if you saturate that lower bound with some state, then you've got effective dynamics that behave very nicely, and and that's an excellent uh, an excellent thing to be able to show. Um, but what I wanted to do, what I was kind of pressing them on was, well, um, sure, but are there any states that actually satisfy that condition, right? So, uh, and the, the initial thing that I was expecting was, well, if we just write down a Gaussian state, maybe it'll do okay, but then there's these concerns in the background. Well, maybe they won't. So I thought it would be worth actually making the calculation. And that's kind of the conclusion is um, their, their analysis is perfectly well defined. Uh, there, uh, there's constructive demonstration that their analysis is perfectly well defined for Gaussian states, provided the variance is taken to be sufficiently low. Okay, I'm going to continue this, although I don't know how long they're going to allow us to stay. Uh, Sahil, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so um, just to follow up question, thank you, Abhay, for clarifying. Uh, this might be a naive question, uh, but I was wondering that this, um, the dependence on fiducial uh, parameters at the kinematical level, when you take the dynamics, uh, when you take the evolution of this kind of state, would it not lead to uh, dependence on V naught at the, in, in the dynamics in some physical parameter? Um, uh, possibly, but I think that what happens is you can, in, in the same way that you can kind of, uh, I think the trick that people often do is, is when you write down your, like your constraint, uh, that's where you start making substitutions where uh, you absorb the fiducial volume into other parameters. And so then uh, the actual constraint doesn't really directly depend on V naught, even if it kind of implicitly depends on V naught at a kinematic level. And then the dynamics that are generated by that, um, provided you've solved all the problems at the kinematic level, you don't have to solve them anymore. They'll just be carried through for free or something like that. I think, does that kind of make some sense? Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I will have to look at it. In, in, the, in, the, in the case when, when the manifold is not compact, the statement is that this V naught is an infrared cutoff and that is needed in every formulation like ADM or anything like that, just because you're homogeneous space and therefore the integrals like, you know, the Hamiltonian terms or the symplectic structure, they will all diverge otherwise. And the whole idea is this infrared cutoff, which at the end of the analysis, you take the limit, V naught goes to infinity. And now in the classical theory, it is perfectly right. Symplectic structure is now regulated. And then you get the equations of motion and you see the equations of motion don't depend on V naught. So that is a realization. And the statement is really the same in quantum, in, in quantum gravity, namely that you should really introduce this because otherwise, you know, even the classical theory is not well defined. But finally, the physical results should be independent, which are, are obtained by taking the, by removing the cutoff, by taking V naught going to infinity. Now, if the manifold is compact, then of course, you know, V naught is not a fiducial cell, and then there is no fiducial cell, so we don't have this at all. But of course, then your question doesn't ar arise because we're only talking about physical quantities. But in loop quantum cosmology, in the non compact manifold, at the end of the day, once you take the limit, V naught going to infinity. Christina? Yeah, first of all, thank you for this uh, excellent talk. I wanted to ask a follow up question to the point I was mentioning. So in a sense, uh, even in the full theory, if we go away from LQC, we just would use harmonic oscillator like coherent states in the sense that they approximate your X and your P well. And then we know, of course, the Hamiltonian is a much more complicated function and we do not expect uh, 
in the sense very good semi-classical states because of these even non-polynomial function. So in a sense, is your result not reflecting this feature that uh, you just work with more complicated functions of the elementary variables you would use in quantum mechanics? And if this is the case, does your result give us some hint what kind of more improved states we could use in order maybe to get a better semi-classical behavior, for instance, for the Hamiltonian constraint? And uh, finally, I just wanted to comment because you were mentioning this Jacobi theta function and the relation to the Gaussian via Fourier transform. This is already in the literature if you look for coherent states on the circle. So people have used this relation there. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, just a moment. Mm -hmm. So, okay, yeah. So I think. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer to your question because uh, in, in truth, I haven't really pushed this analysis through to dynamics just yet. Um, but maybe I, can, maybe I can answer a related question that, that you might appreciate. Um, so something else I have been looking at, again, still sort of at the kinematic level is, well, do there exist any state, any kinematic states whatsoever, whether they're Gaussian or not, uh, that saturate the uncertainty relation? And the answer to that, uh, it seems to me at the moment, is actually no. Um, so what happens is if you, uh, you, can, you can use uh, some results known about, about the conditions under which these inequalities are saturated, uh, and you get a condition basically that you have to have, uh, like, like if there's a condition for, for what constitutes a squeeze state, and then when that condition is met, you end up getting this difference equation that uh, basically requires your state to look kind of like a modified Bessel function to a certain extent. And then the problem is I haven't done very much analysis with, with asymptotics for Bessel functions. So I haven't really secured all of this, but at least in a basic case, it seems like what you get is that you don't have any states that are, are, uh, are, are normalizable at all at the kinematic level that are also um, uh, proper uh, squeeze states or proper states that saturate the inequality. So to an extent, I think that Gaussian states are pretty much the best that you can do insofar as they, uh, they do allow you under particular limits, you have a fair bit of control to make them quite small, to make their fluctuations quite small. Uh, I think as small as you like, but what you don't have uh, are any states at the, at the kinematic level that allow you to exactly um, saturate the bound. So you might be able to find other states that do better than Gaussian states. Um, that would be interesting as well, uh, especially after figuring out what the what the lower bound is or what yeah what the best you can do with the Gaussian state actually is. Um, but I get the sense probably that there's really nothing. Uh, there are no states that, that will get you exactly there, uh, at least insofar as as things have been defined here. Um, and and thanks for that comment actually about the Jacobi theta functions because I've they're really interesting and I haven't seen them very, very much at all. So I'm, I'm glad to see that they've been put to good use elsewhere. Um, does that kind of help a little bit? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. That answers my question a bit, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Okay, as I mentioned, we are sort of on borrowed time, but I wanted to see if there are any questions on the previous talks. I know, noticed a couple of people who raised their hands. And Zhong Wang, I saw you raising your hand, but I'm afraid it was during Aurelien's talk, is there something you would like to say? Aurelien is not here. Oh, yeah. Actually, I just asked, well, I would like to ask him a question about the gravitational wave radiation. Because okay. he's not here, so thank uh -huh. you. Abai, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I, I, right. I mean, the question that I had was really good. You know, or Aurelien's talk and, and uh, Param's talk came kind of one after another. And uh, they were addressing a similar issue. And I, in this, namely, you know, what happens in this collapse and then there's a bounce and so on and so forth. And so I wanted to know if in fact, can one comment on relation between the two things uh, in the sense that Aurelian was saying things like when there is a collapse, then it's all just classical except for a very small Planck regime and so on. And he was drawing that kind of Penrose diagram. So does Param get that kind of Penrose diagram? And can you compare and contrast since Param has not just a scenario, but a detailed calculation. So I can I can make a brief comment that if uh, I think if one uses the simple model which we have studied and uses the holonomy trial 
kind of quantization, then I think some aspects of the qualitative physics which he was discussing will hold. But on the other hand, like if one uses the holonomy and gauge coherent flux modifications, then I don't think that the kind of symmetric bounds which they need will ever occur. So, actually, so like, in your case, uh, the bounce is not symmetric, but then also the mass is different. So what happens to conservation of mass? So there is a conservation law. So I didn't discuss. Yeah. So there is a conservation right. law. So, so, so the, 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 whatever the, the scalar field of the dust or whatever you have, it just comes out? Yes. So, so okay. the, but the conservation law holds. The, the conservation law gets modified because of these quantum gravity modifications, but it, it is still valid. Right. But so the statement is that if I look at distant future, you would get actually the same mass, right? As you started out with, and no. some of it is in the... So the point is that in, it depends on the external observer. So the, ex, the external observer, when he's measuring the mass, if he uses his same Newtonian constant to measure the mass, then he will see a different mass. If the, what happens is that if you are just looking at a cosmological model, with gauge coherent fluxes, then after the bounce, it goes to a classical branch, but with a different Newton's constant, and that Newton constant changes by two over pi. Why that happens is, why it can be explained that in loop quantum cosmology, in ordinary loop quantum cosmology, when we go to the classical limit, we are going to see going to zero on the both sides of the bounce. But with the gauge coherent fluxes, because of the sink term, you go to C going to zero on one side, but you go to pi by lambda on the other side. So this factors of pi, they essentially play a role, which limit you are going to. So the classical right. limit is completely different. And if you assume that the external observer who's watching this cloud collapse and come back, he's not going to change his Newton's constant. He's going to interpret this as a change in the mass. Okay, uh, I think we have to digest that, but thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I had one question. In several of the talks, it was sort of mentioned that the AOS model has problems with asymptotic flatness. And I, if I remember the story correctly. Initially, there was some confusion with that, but that had been sorted out. Is that the status now? That... Yeah, so the statement is really what you mean by problem with asymptotic flatness. I mean, the different, different people mean different things, right? I mean, so if one demands that the metric should go like something A or R, uh, sort of MOR, flat metric plus MOR, then it, it does not. So therefore, I mean, that is what we say explicitly, right? And it does not go like, like that. And so it is not asymptotically flat in this sense, but it is asymptotically flat in the weaker sense, which is, which is spelled out in this uh, paper with Javier, which has to do with, you know, does a curvature go to zero? Can you define nonetheless the ADM mass, um, ADM mass formulae, um, can be written down in many different ways, and all of them are not equivalent if the fall off is weaker. For example, in the standard um, rigorous mathematics literature, people even use the fall off of the metric as low as one upon square root of r, right? And then even then, the, the ADM mass is well defined in some appropriate sense. I mean, they, they, they give. so the ADM mass. Is, so, so the statement is basically, in short answer to your question, is that. We're used to certain con con asymptotic fall off conditions, which are strong, but are, are usually used. And under those conditions, a whole bunch of notions are equivalent. In this case, we do not have the same asymptotic fall off condition. We have got a weaker fall asymptotic fall off condition. And therefore, uh, the question we want to ask is are the physical questions can still be answered with respect to these weaker fall asymptotic fall off questions? And the answer to that is yes. But various people for good reasons may want to have the standard asymptotic conditions and then the answer is yet it is not good for that thank you okay we got a message that are shutting us down so okay. i wanted uh, to invite everyone to open your microphones and thank everyone the traditional way hope to see you on thursday thank you for such a nice session yeah it was really very nice everybody all the talks were wonderful thank you so we'll have 10 talks on Thursday. So please try to come everyone. Thank you, everyone.